And we are ready. Go ahead, Todd. Great. Thank you. And hello, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. On behalf of the Lewy Body Dementia Association, I'd like to thank you all for taking the time out of your Monday um, and for the rest of the week to join us here for this virtual symposium on digital and wearable biomarkers in Lewy body dementia. As you may know, the vision of LBDA is the pursuit of a cure for LBD while providing support for those with the disease. And as part of our mission, we try and catalyze research by engaging all stakeholders in pursuit of a better diagnosis and treatment of Lewy body dementia. The LBDA Research Centers of Excellence program brings together 26 key academic medical research and healthcare institutions around the country committed to advancing the furtherance of understanding research and care around Lewy body dementias. What we have here is the working group, uh, a commitment uh, from the working group, which is uh, the working group clinical trial design and optimization working group, which has been organizing this event for LBDA's Research Center of Excellence program. This is the second in a series uh, of the uh, biomarker symposiums. The co-chairs of the working group are David Irwin uh, from the University of Pennsylvania and Joe Quinn from Oregon Health and Sciences University. As I mentioned, this is the second symposium we're, we're hosting. The first one had nearly 200 in, in attendance back in January. And I think subsequent to that, we've had nearly 450 uh, views of the program on YouTube. It is currently available on our uh, LBDA TV site on lbda.org. And I encourage you all to, if you haven't seen it, to take a look at it. So in addition to Joe Quinn, today's program is led by Dr. Kathleen Poston who's the Associate Professor of Neurology and Neurological Sciences and Neurosurgery at Stanford University Medical Center. We're so pleased that she took the lead on this event. We're most excited with the, two, the great agenda we have, which is broken into two main sections. Section one is on continuous monitoring and sleep and fluctuations in LBD. And ses session two is cognitive and motor digital biomarkers in LBD. I'd also like to thank the LBDA team, including Angela Taylor, Julia Wood, and Andrea Cheney for their efforts in making this program a success. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone again and turn this over to you, Dr. Poston. Thank you so much, Todd, and thank you all for, um, for joining us this morning. Uh, on behalf of myself and my, my co-host, Dr. Joe Quinn, I wanna uh, just thank you for spending the morning with us. As Todd mentioned, really the, um, the challenge and the um, goal of the clinical trials working group within the LBDA uh, Research Centers of Excellence is to try to identify whatever um, ways we can to promote uh, the acceleration of clinical trials in uh, Lewy body dementias. And uh, after our very successful biomarkers symposium earlier this year, uh, we determined that digital and wearable were another area um, where there's been a lot of exciting research. Um, and really the goal of today's symposium is to bring together many of the thought leaders in digital and wearable biomarkers and to think about how we as an LBDA um, um, uh, uh, community can really uh, bring together uh, uh, new research projects to push these into the point where they go from as where they are today from a not quite ready for prime time, as many of them are, into a ready for launch into clinical trials. And that's that's really what we want to do today. So we hope that you will interact with each other, uh, both during the session and after. So just to uh, to go through the, the details this morning's session, uh, we will start off with talking about um, uh, EEG as a biomarker for dementia with Lewy bodies, um, which will be followed up by a conversation about passive monitoring devices, measuring activity and cognition. Uh, 
We will then uh, have a, a wonderful speaker um, discussing approaches to actigraphy analyses, which will then be followed up by a conversation about uh, um, using sleep profiler in REM sleep behavior disorder patients as well as uh, Lewy body dementia patients. We will, um, each of these sessions uh, will go for 20 minutes and then we'll be followed by a discussion um, at the end. And I would like to encourage everybody to please put their questions, their Q and A's, uh, sorry, their questions in the Q and A as the sessions are happening. And myself and Joe Quinn will then uh, moderate those at the end um, and go through all of your uh, questions um, with a focus again on how do we take these um, different approaches from the non not quite ready for prime time and bring them into uh, into reality for uh, for biomarkers in in clinical trials. This afternoon session will focus on cognitive and motor, and I'll introduce uh, those as uh, we get um, begin the afternoon session. So again, uh, please put your questions in the Q&A during the sessions. We will moderate those at the end during the longer discussion. As you can see, we put a big chunk of time for discussion. If you would like to ask your question in person rather than typing it in, please raise your hand and we will um, unmute you. Um, we would like this to get, again be as interactive as possible given the limitations of the session. So. Okay, with that, um, I'm going to have our first speaker uh, pull up her slides as I introduce her. Um, so we are, are thrilled to be able to have an international cast of all stars as our um, speakers this morning. And we're starting off with Dr. Uh, Laura Benani, who is uh, Associate Professor of Neurology um, in Italy. And she is really, in looking through her, her CV, um, just a tour de force of, um, of uh, research uh, with regards to uh, particularly bringing this technology of EEG forward as thinking about how we can use this um, in clinical practice and in clinical trials. Um, and with that, uh, Let's see if we can have you share your slides. Excellent. Yes. yes, you are in presentation mode. Uh, thank you so much. And um, let's go ahead with our first speaker. Thank you, Dr. Possum, for this invitation. And thank you to the LBDA uh, for this event. Uh, I will uh, talk about uh, the application of EEG as a biomarker in uh, dementia with Lewy bodies. In the first slide, actually, I put some uh, pictures of my town, which is Pescara, and this is uh, Howard University, the campus. And I was just to share with you some images because it's not like a very famous town in from you know for for foreign people in Italy. But thank you so much. Um, Actually, I would like to start my presentation with uh, a few um, reminders of what is uh, uh, under the EEG uh, techniques and technology and methodology. Basically, some physical uh, events, which are actually the uh, current flow in a current dipole, is actually under our EEG recordings. So basically, what we all know is that dipoles are created when current flows between a source and a sink that are separated in space. So that's, they are spatially, spatially separated. Uh, the source is the place where the current flows from and the sink is the place where the current flows to. So basically what we can say about our uh, brain is that our pyramidal neuron actually uh, are deemed to be uh, some kind of a dipole. Basically the configuration of a pyramidal neuron is ideal for generating a dipolar current flow. Why is that? It's because apical dendrites are located at a distance from the zoma, so they are spatially separated as in the dipole. And um, we'll have an extracellular current flows along the axis of the cell body, which creates a positive potential at the sink and negative potentials at the source. So basically our pyramidal neurons in the cortex are the perfect dipoles. And we were very lucky with our anatomy because uh, our pyramidal neurons are spatially aligned and perpendicular to the cortical surface, which makes the, the, this configuration to create a dipole layer or dipole sheet in the cortex. So basically the EEG 
the recordings represents the postsynaptic potentials of pyramidal neurons close to the recording electrodes. What we were recording the cortex on the surface of the cortex is basically what we uh, can see as a layer of pyramidal neurons, which creates a big dipole. So in summary, EEGs is the result from the combined activity of a large numbers of similarly oriented pyramidal neurons. This requires a synchronous activity across groups of cells, and EEG then reflects the summation of postsynaptic activity of large cells and samples. So we can summarize this uh, as something that can allow us to, uh, to look under the surface, for example, of an ocean, like all the life of the oceans from the uh, uh, the waves on the surface. So basically recording the surface on our cortex is a way to look under, under what's going on in our brain. The most popular technologies uh, with imaging, for example, uh, functional MRI, PET and SPECT, assess metabolic correlates of neurons, for example, blood flow, blood volume, oxygenation, and they have two distinct advantages over EEG analysis. They have a better spatial resolution as compared to surface EEG. And they have an ability to detect cellular activity in structures that do not contribute to scalp EEG, including cerebellum and most of the subcortical structures. Still, a single cubic millimeter of a cortex the spatial resolution of current functional MRI technology contains an array of approximately 13,000 pyramidal neurons, 24,000 glial cells, 100 billion of synapses, and one tenth of a kilometer of axons. As for EEG, although electrical activity from as few as 10,000 pyramidal cells acting synchronously in our cell layer may be detectable at the scalp, each electrolyte cell spans an area containing 5 million pyramidal neurons or more beneath it. So in this graph, we can see the spatial resolution, which definitely better in PET and fMRI as compared to surface AEG. Uh, we're not talking about implanted EEG, but just the surface, the, what we record usually routinely in our, in our uh, uh, recordings. However, EEG can detect changes and modification in brain activity a thousand times faster than most biochemical indices. And since they are not measures of cell metabolism, but the summation of cortical postsynaptic potentials themselves, they represent a distant eavesdrops of the brain's inner working. So the EEG signals results mainly from the postsynaptic activity of the pyramidal neurons in the surface of the brain, and scalp potentials, what we record on a scalp, are especially sensitive to radially oriented dipoles generating the pyramidal neurons in the gyri, what we record here on the scalp. EEG may be analyzed in different ways, qualitatively or quantitatively. In qualitative analysis, the features, the characteristics of EEG uh, are characterized in a general way in a categorical fashion. So basically some evidence of abnormality um, of, uh, um, or, a physio or physiological state exists or doesn't or is or isn't likely. It's like a full or nothing hypothesis. This is what we see in a qualitative analysis. These are the waves that routinely we record in our clinical practice. And we can differentiate different types of brain waves in normal AG as related to the presence of different rhythms. Uh, here we can see a beta um, rhythm. It's very fast. Uh, it's present in the adult during mental activity in frontal region, especially. The, it has an amplitude of 20 microvolts and a frequency between 13 and 30 hertz. We have an alpha activity, which is present at rest in the physiological adult brain with eyes closed and it's mostly present in occipital region. Uh, it has a frequency between 8 and 13 hertz and an amplitude between 50 and 100 uh, microvolts. And we have here the theta activity, which is lower than the half activity. Um, it has a frequency between uh, 4 and 8 hertz. 
um, a micro, I mean, a, um, an amplitude which is higher than 50 microvolts. It's present in children, in drowsy adults, in during emotional distress, and is uh, basically in this case more uh, occipital uh, as presentation. We have here the delta activity, which is the slowest um, activity that we can record in our routine EEG. It's basically uh, an activity which has a frequency between 0 0.5 and 4 hertz, uh, an um, amplitude above 50 microvolts, and is present physiologically in, in children during sleep. And we have here spikes of an epileptic activity. So these are basically what we can see and say during a qualitative analysis. Well, the quantification of EEG recording, actually uh, in this uh, quantitative analysis, these characteristics are subjected to a mathematical and statistical analysis. And the extent of each feature is examined uh, and is calculated, mathematically calculated. Each approach can classify the EEG record in terms of frequency or period, or amplitude, phase relations, morphology, so the waveform, topology, abundance, reactivity, and variability of these parameters. For example, continuous, random, paroxysmos, et cetera. One of the possibility to uh, use quantification of EEG recording is to, to apply the fast Fourier transform, which is what we have done in uh, most of the study in, in uh, TLB. Basically, what the Fourier does is to decompose the EEG time series into a voltage by frequency spectral graph analysis called the power spectrum, with power being the square of the EEG magnitude and magnitude being the integral average of the amplitude of the EEG signal measured from peak to peak across the time sample, which is also called epoch of the EEG recording. Sorry, the epoch length determines the frequency resolution on the Fourier transform with one second epoch uh, length providing a one hertz resolution, a two second epoch providing a uh, half of uh, hertz or plus minus 0 0.5, hertz resolution. But basically what we do with the uh, quantification with a fast Fourier transform is to change what we see in time domain to a frequency domain. So basically the most um, a present frequency that we can record in our uh, qualitative analysis, which can be the alpha, the theta, the delta activity, uh, is changed as a peak of frequency in this spectral array configuration. So we have a decomposed signal. Basically, we go from a very uh, chaotic signal to a very simple signal in the quantification. Quantitative EEG focuses basically on sinusoidal signals, this one, as we see before, from peak to peak, and divide the frequency spectrum into relevant frequency bands to capture these periodic features. So the beam power spectrum in most studies on dementia and neurodegenerative conditions is divided automatically into four frequency bands, which have seen also before in qualitative analysis, the delta, theta, the alpha activity, and one specific band that we called pre-alpha or plus theta activity, which is between 5.5 and 8 hertz. So these are the configuration we can see uh, in different subjects recorded with uh, this compressed spectral analysis, the peak-to-peak -peak frequency. This one is a um, physiological state, the resting state EG, where we can see a subject with a peak frequency in the alpha band, which is the normal, the physiological activity that we can record at rest in occipital derivation, with a very low dominant frequency variability. You can see here that epoch by epoch, every row is a two second of EEG recording. You see the same peak with the same frequency. This is a very stable EEG recording with an alpha activity, which is prominent in all the epoch recorded. In these other subjects, we can see the presence of, uh, in some epochs of the recording, of uh, alpha peaks of frequency, these ones, and the appearance of a lower or slower activity of the recording, which is here in the pre-alpha uh, frequency range between 5.5 and 8 hertz, a little slower, with a high frequency variability. So epoch by epoch, you can see different peaks with a high variability. 
This is another possibility. This is not physiological, it's definitely pathological. And another pathological possibility here is to record the absence of half activity and the peaks of frequency of dominant frequency are present in bands that are all slower than alpha activity between pre-alpha here and theta bands. These are all, as we will see, uh, pathological uh, recordings. These records they can also be seen in uh, as spectral maps. I won't talk about uh, very uh, detail in, in details with the, of spectral maps. But basically, the colors here represent uh, in a pseudo color scale the presence of uh, the most uh, dominant frequency uh, present in, uh, in that specific derivation. In this case, for example, we have a, the presence of a blue color, which is basically a delta band. Here's the two hertz and the 12 hertz, but it's a, yeah, it's a slowing of uh, EEG activity, but we won't talk about this in detail. But in any investigation, especially in EEG, we should ask ourselves what we're trying to do. With EEG spectral analysis, we convert voltage amplitude into frequencies. Why we do that? Because we believe that mental processes are better reflected in the periodicities of events and that we identified much more than the raw values that we detect. We should be able to observe these periodicities in the visual record and not direction and possible functions. Else we may just be fooling ourselves. This means that when we do quantification, we also need, always need to go back to the qualitative analysis and see what we are looking at. If we're looking at artifacts or what we're looking at uh, with some meaning for our patients. The further removed our analysis takes us from the raw signal, the more likely error has crept in. This is one mathematical uh, actually uh, um, uh, concept that we need to keep in mind. Nonlinear and highly derived indexes of EEG activity run the risk of being empirical meaningless, uninterpretable, or fraught with unproven or untestable assumptions. So this is very important to look at the trace. So the errors that we can, we can put in our analysis that an underfitting error, uh, when we see something that is too simple to explain the variance in our uh, you know, periodic changes in EG recordings. This is what we will see in appropriate fitting, like you, know, you see a good mathematical description without artifacts that can actually be under a physiological or pathological um, with, with meaning in our, in our subjects. And we can also run the risk of overfitting when we force fitting too good to be true analysis, where we go, you know, with analysis to an order to basically test our hypothesis and to prove our hypothesis uh, beyond what the data of our qualitative EEG and recordings actually can tell us. Rhythmicities in the signal are generally thought and considered to be caused by neuronal synchronization from extensive inhibitory processes within the thalamocortical system. So the cross talk between the thalamus and the cortex, or from negative feedback among excitatory and inhibitory neurons, or both, depending upon the frequency of interest. So based on the bands that we are looking at, we need to, uh, uh, to consider these two possibilities. And by its definition, rhythmic signals are periodic and relatively easy to analyze given the regularity of the features. So talking, talking more specifically um, about the thalamocortical connections, which makes basically the rhythm that we record in our surface EEG, we can say in a very easy way the rhythm comes from the thalamus. And firing properties and ionic conductance of thalamocortical neurons are very peculiar. Thalamocortical neurons respond to input from sensory pathways of the cortex by discharging in two different modes, tonic bursts and arrhythmic bursts. These discharge modes affect the pattern of the EEG that we record. Tonic single spike firing occurs during wakefulness and REM sleep, and rhythmic burst fires occurs in non-REM sleep. These two patterns of discharge depend on multiple states, the rest of membrane potentials, activation of calcium channels, the inputs, which are excitatory from cortex, inhibitory from reticular nucleus, uh, ascending modulatory input from brainstem, cholinergic and monaminergic nuclei. 
For example, when the resting potential of thalamic cells is hyperpolarized, excitatory inputs activate T-type calcium channels that initiate rhythmic burst activity, leading to synchronization of the EEG, as happens, for example, during non-REM sleep. Since EEG signals refract functional changes in the cerebral cortex, um, we can say that EEG-based markers can be used to assess neuronal degeneration long before actual tissue loss or behavioral symptoms appear. As such, EEG is a promising technique or tool with the potential of serving as a supportive biomarker and or alternative to existing tools. Uh, but with the advantage of being non-invasive and portable. For the more EGs as better spatial uh, temporal resolution, as we have seen, than uh, neural image techniques. And another important concept is, is that EG signals have been studied in healthy elderly people, showing that there are no substantial changes in EEG associated with age, making EG a suitable technique for dementia assessment, basically older, healthy subject have a normal EEG. So the thalamus plays a major role. Uh, it's like a uh, director of an opera, an orchestra, in orchestrating the change in the discharge pattern of the cortical neurons that underlies EEG differences between wakefulness, non-REM sleep. And this is because thalamic neurons, like the cortical pyramidal neurons that we've seen before, have intrinsic membrane properties that can cause the charge pattern to change as a function of the uh, level of depolarization of the cell. So when depolarized, these neurons discharge in a single spike mode. When hyperpolarized, they display a bursting pattern. Since their level of depolarization is uh, highly dependent of a sending activating system projected to the forebrain, the discharge patterns will be modulated by the varying levels of the ascending activating system neurotransmitters as wakefulness alternates with the states of sleep. Basically, we can say that what happens in the thalamus reflects in the cortex. They are very strictly correlated and related. So basically, the thalamus is a pacemaker for what happens in the cortex. It has been known for a very long time that the, the brain can, en can encounter a different state that can last for a short to a relative long time where a portion of the thalamocortical system is stuck in a spindle-like burst mode activity, whereas the rest of the system of the brain remains in the usual waking state. So the question at hand is what happens if a set of neurons in the thalamocortical uh, system displays low rhythmicity in an otherwise awakened brain state? This is a seminal um, uh, work made by Mehowal and Shank uh, very long ago in 1991. We can have four possibility. We can have a dissociation from prevailing wakefulness due to intrusions of characteristics of other stages of consciousness into ongoing wakefulness. It is called within mind dissociation. In this state, uh, hallucination of the um, characteristic with the hypnagogic or hypnopompic hallucination and complex nocturnal hallucinations can appear in which dreamentation occurs during the transition from sleep to wakefulness and vice versa. A second possibility is that dissociation from a non-REM sleep due to intrusion of features of other stages of, of uh, sleep into ongoing non-REM sleep. The third possibility is dissociation from REM sleep due to intrusion of characteristic of other stage, stages of sleep into ongoing REM sleep. It's called mind-body dissociation. And in this condition, the brain is asleep. We have a REM dream mentation, we are dreaming, while the body is still awake. So the spinal motor neurons are still excitable instead of being inhibited during our, our REM sleep, as, or, as happens uh, physiologically. And the fourth possibility is the status dissociatus, where motor agitations um, have, um, take, takes place within active dreams, on areas, continuous semi-continuous movements, impaired level of vigilance with fluctuations in attention, and sometimes confabulation and mental confusion. For all of us that um, are actually uh, very um, familiar with dementia with Lewy bodies, maybe something is uh, basically uh, 
making our uh, brain to uh, agree in some way. What we are talking about, we are probably talking about visual hallucinations, parasomnias, REM sleep behavior disorders, delirium, and cognitive fluctuations, which are the very core features of dementia with Lewy bodies. So basically, the, it, our hypothesis is that probably what is under the appearance of the phenomenology of DLB, fluctuating cognition, visual hallucination, RBD, is probably a thalamocortical dysrhythmia. And also, uh, as a supported biomarkers um, in the diagnosis of DLB, we know that pr prominent posterior slow wave activity on EEG with periodic fluctuations in the pre-alpha theta range are supported for this phenomenological appearance. So um, our study on the EEG and to uh, validate the hypothesis that a thalamocortical dysrhythmia will be under the appearance of phenomenology of DLB was based on the seminal work by the Newcastle group, uh, which is a group with, with, with was actually the, uh, the, the most uh, active group on DLB study in Europe. Uh, where in uh, the late, actually 2000, so 20 years ago, basically, explained that if you see, if you want to look at the DEG in a dynamic way, uh, going from HEPOC to HEPOC and looking at probably changes of a frequency of a EEG in patients with DLB as compared to Alzheimer's disease on healthy controls, here are the spectral method we have, have shown before, we can see that in DLB patients, we see a change in colors from HEPOC to HEPOC, which is the meaning of a change of uh, dominant frequency in the EEG recording. Basically, we have a high uh, dominant frequency variability. So something in its changes, but sparing across the, the, the HEPOC of EEG recording as compared to a very stable color map in Alzheimer's disease and healthy controls. So based on this uh, seminal paper, uh, we uh, actually um, designed a longitudinal prospective uh, work in our, uh, it was, it was a, this was a single center work uh, published in 2008 in our center, where we looked at the uh, peak of frequency in compressed spectral arrays, as I showed you before, uh, as a method. And we define several mathematical descriptors to look at the EEG quantifications. We define the dominant frequency, frequency, which is the peak of frequency that I showed you before, this compact spectral array quantification. So this peak of frequency is the dominant frequency, which is the frequency that's most prevalent in that epoch. The dominant frequency, frequency range, which expresses the range of dominant frequency in all the epochs explored in our EEG recordings and dominant frequency variability, which is the um, uh, standard deviation of dominant frequency from epoch to epoch. We have seen before that, for example, here we have a very low dominant frequency variability in a physiological state. Here we have in this subject a higher dominant frequency variability, and even here even a higher dominant frequency variability. The mathematical descriptor that actually um, um, then uh, became the most important uh, in our statistical analysis were the dominant frequency, dominant frequency variability, and the frequency prevalence, which is the percent of epochs where prevalence of a dominant frequency band was observed. So how many epochs actually shows that per specific dominant frequency? We were able to define different patterns of EEG in DLB. And what we have found basically in that single center study that while 100% of Alzheimer's disease patients and control subjects had uh, a compressed spectral array patterns uh, represented by the presence of an alpha activity in occipital derivations, DLB patients never uh, express that patterns. They always said the slowing of dominant frequency with a higher dominant frequency variability. These are the patterns we can see in DLB. This is an Alzheimer's disease subject, very stable at nine hertz. You can see here the peak of frequency, very, very stable without dominant frequency variability in the alpha band, the nine hertz is a, a normal alpha band. While patients with DLB shows um, higher a variability of dominant frequency peaks 
between an alpha and a pre-alpha band, let's see here with dominant frequency variability, or the complete absence of alpha frequency with appearance of a pre-alpha band, which can be stable or intermingled with even lower frequencies. So we can say that the abnormal EEG of the LV patients is characterized by the appearance of this fast theta of pre-alpha activity during wakefulness. This presence predicts the occurrence of cognitive declines, and that's because we have seen this in the very early phases of the disease, even in the MCI stage of the, uh, of the disease, so before the dementia appearance. This can track the evolution of mild cognitive impairment in the LB, and is correlated with severity of a cognitive fluctuation in the LB. These are the this is the scatter plot actually showing how they can be very highly separated between patients with DLB, or in, in this case, there were also Parkinson's disease with the cognitive fluctuations with a high uh, pre-alpha uh, prevalence in their EEG, while Alzheimer's disease patients and control subject at only an alpha frequency is so completely separated. And this is the correlation with the CAF score, the clinical assessment fluctuations. In the LB, we can see that the EEG pattern is more disrupted in patients with a higher level of cognitive fluctuation, even at onset of the, of the disease. So the presence of the pre-alpha frequency with the high frequency variability um, have been also, uh, has been also confirmed by several studies by other groups. Um, it records in all the studies reported independently of the method of analysis. So basically, uh, as compared to the first original work, uh, we have also validated uh, this um, parameter in a multicenter study um, in the uh, context of the European DLB consortium, where several centers provided EEG recordings. We found the same, the same that in posterior derivation, DLB patients had a high presence of pre-alpha frequency while Alzheimer's disease patients have an alpha frequency. The same has been confirmed uh, by the, um, the group of, of Amsterdam. Uh, they have seen um, the, the same frequency at um, pre-alpha range at 7 hertz in prodromal DLB going on to uh, um, um, have an evolution to a DLB, to a dementia case. And uh, while prodromal Alzheimer's disease actually showed the presence of a uh, in alpha frequency. And also other groups, again, the Newcastle group, uh, where we multimodal analysis actually correlated the presence of low frequencies, not typical derivation together with middle temporal low um, uh, volume um, preservation uh, in the LB patients. And again, more, um, more um, actually works on a, a idiopathic RBD evolving to um, um, alpha synucleinopathy with neurodegeneration. Actually, they show the presence of occipital frequency in a pre alpha band here. And again, here is another study by Cavines uh, looking at background rhythm of frequency in uh, um, ILBD and patients with uh, uh, DLB and PDD. Actually, we have seen again the presence of uh, slowing of, uh, of uh, the um, uh, background frequency, which is lower than alpha. And this is a work uh, done with machine learning in Parkinson's disease with dementia. In this work, it's a French group. Uh, they show that the presence of a uh, pre-alpha frequency and theta frequency in patients with Parkinson's disease evolving to dementia. So basically, um, this was one of the reasons why we could actually include uh, EEG as a supportive biomarker for the diagnosis of DLB. This is a supportive biomarker, and it's the first time when actually um, EEG uh, was um, considered as a biomarker of a neurodegenerative condition. So far, only uh, creutzfeldt jakob disease had a specific EEG uh, pattern as uh, for the diagnosis. And um, Basically, my conclusion is that the use of physiological methods such as EEG uh, permits the interrogation network function with excellent temporal resolution. They are very easy to record because they are non-invasive and portable. Uh, they not, do not depend on intact motor or language function on the participant engagement because they can be uh, recorded at rest. The location, nature, and overlap of cortical neural network disruption in the brain can be directly measured and quantified as a readout reflecting cortical neural excitability. 
synchronization and connectivity as neuro as, as relevant underpinning of cognitive and sensory motor function. What is missing uh, to make EEG as an indicative biomarker for DLD so far is harmonization. So basically standardization of techniques to, of recording and of analysis across centers. And this is actually the message that I would like to uh, uh, um, actually uh, make for this uh, from from this talk and um, to share with you is that probably if we um, bring our efforts together uh, to try to standardize our methods we can find a method uh, to detect this uh, specific condition in a very easy way thank you so much Thank you so much, Dr. Bonani. That that was really just an amazing, uh, amazing uh, presentation. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to ask our next speaker to start uploading his his uh, sharing his screen. But I want to encourage everybody to please put questions you have uh, uh, for Dr. Bonani into the Q and A, and we will make sure we address all of those uh, during the discussion. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Jeffrey Kay, who is professor of of neurology and biomedical engineering and director of the Leighton Aging and Alzheimer's Disease Center, as well as the Oregon Center for Aging and Technology at uh, OHSU. He will be speaking to us this morning about passive monitoring devices for measuring activity and cognition. Thank you so much, Dr. K. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, and, I can. And I can see your slide. Terrific. Thank you very much. All right, so I'm gonna uh, dive in here and uh, talk about um, passive monitoring of um, many activities. Uh, and I would just start out by saying uh, one person's passive, maybe another person's active. So it's all relative. Um, even just being in a study uh, knowing that is uh, something that may uh, influence your behavior. So we'll go from there. Um, by way of uh, background, um, I want to start out by just reviewing what the classic paradigm of assessment is, and that is um, you might identify persons at risk, uh, and then they are seen, um, they have been traditionally seen in a clinic or a uh, facility uh, for baseline kinds of visits, and then follow up. Most recently, with the, uh, particularly with the pandemic, uh, we've become increasingly uh, aware and uh, able to provide uh, televideo kinds of visits. These are uh, very helpful, of course, but they're still episodic um, and time-limited uh, kinds of visits. What we're going to focus on a lot today is <clears throat> the idea that one can add many other kinds of um, so-called digital biomarkers to inform uh, what is happening um, in a particular patient. Um, and these are worn everywhere, embedded even, um, implanted, as well as possibly uh, always or typically uh, paired with a, um, a device, typically a smartphone. But that is somewhat of a limited view by itself in the sense that these are um, uh, often seen as single channel kinds of approaches. That is that it's a, one uses a wearable or a, um, uh, a single function such as sleep or mobility or gait. Um, and I wanna uh, move more to talking about a holistic kind of approach where one can take advantage of uh, these technologies uh, together embedded in the everyday function of people as they go about their daily lives. And so this idea of pervasive computing digital assessment really brings us to being able to collect continuously much more objective data in real time that is ideally home and community-based. Uh, it's thus inherently ecologically valid and uh, collects what might be called everyday cognition. That is, instead of measuring simply a artificial cognitive test, um, one is having people do what are cognitive tasks, such as remembering to take medication or using a computer or driving. The data is uh, very, um, high dimensional, so-called big data, which lends itself also to uniquely uh, providing intra-individual measures of change. Now, before I dive into that, uh, I want to say that uh, there's many challenges to this kind of work uh, that we all know. Um, 
not the least of which are the uh, engagement, adherence, and usability issues. Uh, the graphic shown here is from the review of um, eight <laughs> Apple uh, research kit studies different in different disease groups, including Parkinson's disease in the MPower study. The bottom line here is that uh, despite um, tens of thousands of people enrolling online to these studies, uh, after about uh, less than two weeks, 50% uh, ceased engagement. And this is true in, in other kinds of studies here using uh, the body-worn activity um, active graph um, in a later stage series of patients, um, uh, assisted living kinds of, or, or nursing home kinds of patients. Um, you can see that um, between 40 and 70% uh, of the patients uh, were uh, not tolerating the sensor um, in, in this study, uh, although obviously the data was very helpful for those that did. Now, why this might be is um, a lot of the issues are uh, come down to uh, specifics of usability. Uh, so on the left, you can see that women have pockets often that don't uh, match those of men in many cultures or societies. Um, and this may just limit their, where something is worn, whether it's looked at or uh, used as usable. On the right are some images, recent images of some supposedly designed for older people, uh, wearables, um, which are rather large and bulky. So the, the principle, the old saw of, uh, you know, the right tool for the right job is extremely important here. And this is where being as um, unobtrusive and as, uh, naturalistic as possible is really important. Um, so in this work uh, over um, the past decade or two now, uh, there's been a lot of interest in trying to uh, bring these tools into the home environment on a more continuous long-term basis. About um, four years ago, the NIH and the VA um, issued an RFA for the Collaborative Aging Research Using Technology Initiative. Um, and this was a call to provide a uh, platform that would allow researchers across the US and elsewhere uh, to be able to use these tech, digital technologies um, in their research, uh, but to have this, these used in a way that made them uh, not dependent on any particular technology or methodology. So they needed to be technology agnostic use case flexible, open, shareable, scalable, and ultimately optimized um, for long-term assessment in multiple domains of function, um, and in particular in diverse populations. This is often a problem in our field, is, um, is making sure that diversity is, uh, is achieved. So what's, what's shown here is the uh, is various domains of function that were uh, that have been looked at. We, um, OHSU, were fortunate to um, have this award, um, and it was built on a platform that um, had been developed at the uh, Oregon Center for Aging Technology. And the platform um, really starts without throwing away the conventional assessments. Um, so we don't want to ignore that rich data, but also to be able to include data, for example, from um, electronic medical records and even external environment. But the heart of the data collection centers around digital uh, tools to collect uh, information uh, around these major domains, um, such as, you know, uh, obviously important for our discussion today, all of them really. Um, behind those uh, do domains of function are multiple uh, potential devices or sensors that can be used. And I'll uh, elaborate on these uh, further in a moment, but uh, just uh, at a higher level. Uh, so for example, uh, cognition can be uh, examined by looking at uh, computer use, whether that's a tablet, a smartphone, a laptop, and looking at it with regard to sending specific queries frequently, uh, uh, ecological momentary assessment kinds of assessments or uh, formal tests, or um, just in the background looking at meta aspects. So how often a person is on their computer, what time of day they use their computer and so forth. Mobility can be, as we this group knows all too well, can be assessed using passive motion sensors, wearables. Um, there, there's dozens of techniques for doing that. 
Uh, similarly, sleep can be looked at passively with wearable bed mats. There's, there's many uh, ways of doing that. Uh, just going around this uh, ho home um, uh, briefly, uh, health behaviors can look, be looked at like using an electronic pill box to record the time of day when medications are taking, taken, um, physiologic, I'm sorry, um, uh, driving function can be looked at by tapping into the data port of a vehicle. Uh, there's many physiologic devices, um, scales and um, blood pressure and so forth that can be wirelessly obtained at home. And then recently we've been particularly interested in uh, sensing the indoor environment and its effect on health and behavior. Now we all know also that the uh, changes in technology are really rapid. And so um, one has to be able to incorporate uh, new sensors and methods and relate them actually to the older ones that you have been using. All of this data is um, important to be sent securely, privately, um, and safely uh, for further analysis and sharing. So I'm going to now uh, just, you know, so, so the, the um, idea though is ultimately that these um, tools are embedded in the everyday function of the persons who enroll in these studies. And uh, there was, as I mentioned in the CARD initiative, for example, um, uh, there were four cohorts, a uh, older African-American cohort in Chicago from the Minority Aging Research Study, um, a group of Latinx um, older Americans in Miami, uh, a group of veterans, uh, mostly in rural areas of the Northwest, and then a group of uh, older adults living in low-income housing, Section 202 housing. Um, some examples of these different areas of function and how they can be measured um, in the home every day. Uh, so for example, one can look at computer use shown here, just in terms of mean days on the computer, but also you can look at the variability day to day, uh, time in a typical session. These clearly decline in individuals with mild cognitive impairment over time compared to age match controls. Uh, Mobility <laughs> similarly can be looked at in numbers number of ways here, looking at walking speed using a sensor line of passive sensors in the home, uh, the variability being sensitive to detecting early versus late MCI. Social engagement, uh, there are a number of ways of looking at this. A Sim uh, simple way is simply looking at the time a couple spends together apart or out of the home using, in this case, passive sensors and contact sensors on the doors. Um, shown in this uh, spiral plot. And then sleep, again, can be looked at uh, in a number of ways, um, whether it's uh, passive sensing shown here um, over uh, 26 weeks in the study of people with MCI and age match controls, uh, but also with wearables or bed mat. One of the other interesting uh, things that we also think is important is to look at the uh, potential uh, bed partner as well, uh, who may be affecting the other person's sleep uh, that we measure, and in fact, may even be different if they're even in another room, but I still find a time-linked effect. Now, despite our love, or certainly my love of um, remote assessment, um, it is unsupervised data. And so uh, one often needs to have, or really does need to have uh, context information um, and, um, we found over many years of doing this kind of assessment that um, the most effective way to get this context information reliably is to ask once a week, a very brief forced choice questionnaire, these 13 questions that deal with issues of internal states that people just have to tell you about, whether they're uh, down in blue, uh, lonely, uh, rating their pain, uh, health events that might occur, falls, uh, injuries, hospitalizations, medication changes are very important, uh, and so forth. Uh, this, this is delivered um, on the device of a person's choice on a weekly basis um, and gets about 80% uh, adherence over many, many, actually many years. Uh, as an example, just showing some early data from the pandemic in the top panel from the older cohort in the low-income housing in the Portland area, uh, showing the, uh, the arrows when the pandemic started, or was announced essentially uh, in the increase in loneliness on these weekly reports. The bottom panel is just showing step counts using the wearable 
um, in the Mars cohort in Chicago and the decrease in that activity um, as the pandemic uh, rolled out uh, and even showing some potential difference in those with higher or lower levels of cognition. Well, in addition to these kinds of um, embedded uh, uh, passive sensing um, signals, there are, uh, in terms of direct questioning, uh, there are other ways of getting at uh, or analyzing this data that is comes for free, if you will, as long as you are recording the data. So for example, uh, one can look at uh, the uh, how a finger moves across a touch screen or how a mouse moves. Um, and these have been shown to be different in those with in mild cognitive impairment versus those who don't have mild cognitive impairment, as well as I mentioned the time of day for example, uh, when a person would typically, for them, uh, answer a weekly questionnaire. There's a tremendous interest in looking at um, captured uh, uh, conversations and language, speech. Uh, and in the iConnect study, uh, with my colleague uh, Hiroko Dodge, we, uh, using this platform, have been capturing um, conversations uh, and then analyzing them post hoc as well. These are daily conversations four times a week held for six months in this particular study. And so for example, um, those with MCI have been uh, shown to generate a greater proportion of words actually compared to the other conversationalists. But briefly, very briefly wanna mention validation, um, which is not trivial at all. For long-term kind of embedded sensing, um, you know, research activists are terrific, um, but they have uh, limitations of usability at different levels. Um, so uh, if you don't want to charge or uh, you want something that is typically more, um, has a form factor that may be more uh, amenable for many people, uh, you want to be able to at least correlate uh, what the uh, relationships of these devices are. Uh, similarly, one wants to look at conventional cognitive tests, for example, relative to um, the um, digital biomarkers. So looking at walk, various measures of walking uh, versus cognitive function in these tables. I won't go into details, obviously, here today, or the functional scales relative to um, survey completion aspects. There's biological digital correlations here showing the relationship of that computer use time to uh, declining to uh, loss of medial temporal lobe volumes, uh, MRIs work with um, it's, uh, Lisa Silver has done. And then uh, finally, uh, also looking at the pathologic correlates. So these are some data from uh, there's about 44 people who died and had been monitored during life uh, with the system showing that computer use time, total sleep time, um, walking speed and time out of home are correlated with, uh, in this case, Brock scores, but also um, amyloid plaque or neuritic plaque um, CRAD scores. So I'm going to end with some just some examples. Um, I don't have <coughs> a specific Lewy body dementia cases to show, so I'm just going to show some Parkinson's related cases um, as examples using this kind of approach. Case A is a gentleman who entered an aging study at the age of 86, uh, independent. He was mon began being monitored at the uh, age of 90, uh, was not demented. Uh, he developed Parkinson's disease, a diagnosis um, in 2012, the age of 91, was not cognitively impaired at the time. Um, he actually subsequently did become impaired. But what you see in this uh, uh, figure is his top. Um, Open circles are 100 age match controls, their uh, gait speed or walking speed in home. And these uh, red stars are this gentleman's. <laughs> these are aggregated weekly measures over these time periods from 2011, in this case, to 2013. <clears throat> and um, then you can see um, he was treated with um, Cinemet and had some improvement, didn't come back to base, his old baseline. Interestingly, these three dots represent his walking speed taken with a stopwatch in clinic. So he was able to generate uh, a rapid walk when he was um, seen in person. Uh, these are spiral plots to show the same gentleman uh, when he was healthy in these two months uh, and then a year later. 
um, when he'd been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And you can see this, these are uh, eight weeks going out of 24-hour uh, cycles um, with the red being mostly um, bathroom and bedroom activity, um, very disrupted. And then there was some normalization of this pattern with his uh, treatment. Another view of this gentleman's uh, activity. Uh, so this is the uh, period I showed you earlier, um, going out to 2014. He subsequently moved to assisted living and we moved and we uh, instrumented that apartment. And you can see here uh, some differences in his activity in terms of uh, walking speed. Um, he continued to decline. He had some falls and required more assistance. And he's, he has subsequently uh, died. And I was wanting to provide his pathology, but I was told yesterday or a couple of days ago that there's a shortage of paraffin wax, so computer chips and paraffin wax. So we don't have that. I don't have that result to tell you today, but we'll find out soon. In any event, this gentleman also, um, just showing here uh, sleep time, this is just total sleep time, uh, slowly declining with increased variability, at least um, initially, um, and then uh, declining quite a bit. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to point out that one can look at other aspects uh, that may be important for uh, quality of life. So for example, here, uh, showing uh, whether he made uh, one, none, one or two, or or, or greater than three trips to the bathroom. So increasing number of trips to the bathroom decreased with his treatment, but then there was some increase again and um, adjustment of his medication. Um, and then this second case um, is, uh, is just to show some other detail uh, that is possible to look at um, in, this, in this prospective kinds of long-term monitoring. So this is a gentleman again who entered, he had actually mild cognitive impairment when he entered um, the long, a different longitudinal study. Um, but here are his, this case is wearable data. So these are step counts. And then um, showing this line where he was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease and his treatment uh, pattern over here. And then just um, uh, exploding or uh, enlarging uh, in greater detail the daily, uh, time, so this is time of day and this is 24 hours here. And then the color code here is number of steps um, in the, in the, per hour. So you can see um, these differences uh, over uh, different patterns over time. And then um, I also wanted to mention the uh, importance of non-motor changes uh, and, and cognitive changes. So here is the same case with the report of pain uh, over um, uh, the, the transition uh, to the Parkinson's diagnosis um, with a um, increase in pain that he reported interfered with his daily life. And there was not other reasons that we could uh, identify um, in this uh, explanation or his report other than perhaps his uh, actual diagnosis of Parkinson's. Um, and then the last uh, point I wanna make here is um, that <laughs> the interesting relationships between the patient uh, and his partner, um, his, his wife. Um, and um, so here, these are his uh, step counts pre and post diagnosis. By the way, this is the COVID period. I want to just point that out that, that we, this was during this is during this period. Um, and um, I don't I'm not going to make a lot of um, conclusions on a um, uh, to, on one case, but uh, just to give the uh, the feeling the sense of what uh, can potentially be uh, looked at. Uh, when one uh, considers uh, the two individuals together in a dyadic kind of way. Um, so in that sense, I, I also wanted to uh, bring out the idea that um, one wants to think holistically about what's happening uh, in daily life, not just about the individual, but their people they may be living with, as well as their typical movements about their homes um, on their uh, on any given day. So what's shown here, uh, this is uh, uh, 
a work of Chai Yi Wu uh, in our group, showing um, on the left uh, room transitions and dwell times <clears throat> over just a three hour period. And this is just a loop that plays over and again. Uh, and then on the right, the average room occupancy. And what's, what one can do with this kind of data is really begin to look at habits uh, that may uh, diverge as people develop um, uh, motor as well as cognitive uh, impairment. Uh, and so uh, in a uh, recent study, this was just presented at the AAIC meeting, uh, looking at people with MCI versus not uh, age match group, um, those with MCI were less likely to leave home for a prolonged period of time in the morning. They were more likely to leave home um, for a prolonged time in the afternoon. And they were uh, more, uh, less likely, two times less likely to spend time in the kitchen uh, or make trips to the kitchen in the evening. So there, these are habitual patterns that may be uh, very uh, telling. And I think, you know, being able to look, this going back to case, the first case I described, um, these are um, just I, to simplify this, these are um, every four weeks, the reports, self reports of some of those uh, weekly changes, uh, and then looking at those relative to um, the number of walks in the, in the house. So this is number of walks, um, and this is the uh, average over this time period for this individual. And you can see these very interesting fluctuations that may be related to specific activities that you wouldn't know about unless you had um, this sort of combination of data available. So I ran through this quite quickly. Uh, I didn't have a lot of time, but I wanted to certainly leave time for, for others and time for discussion, which is the most important part. Uh, thank you. And I look forward to speaking with everyone subsequently. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. K. Um, for anyone who we're, we're going to transition to our next speaker, but um, please do uh, put some questions uh, in the Q&A, uh, which Dr. K can answer some of them in real time, and then we will have some of them for part of the, um, the discussion at the end. Uh, uh, Dr. Zeitzer, if you wouldn't mind pulling up your slides while I do the quick introduction. Um, so our next speaker, uh, is uh, Dr. Uh, Jamie uh, Zeitzer, who is the Associate Professor of Psychiatry here at Stanford University and a health science specialist at the VA Palo Alto Healthcare System. Uh, he is a specialist in sleep circadian rhythms and the brain's response uh, to light. Um, and with that regard, he's going to speak, be speaking to us about some functional approaches to actigraphy analysis, as I've been trying to uh, pull him into the field of dementia with Lewy bodies over, over the past year. And this is, this is part of my attempt on, on that side. So uh, Dr. Zeitzer, thank you for speaking to us today. And we look forward to hearing about your work. Sure, thank you so much, Dr. Post. And I, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, so I, I'm gonna talk to you about uh, kind of a, a slightly deeper dive into some of the stuff that, that Dr. K um, was talking about um, and really, I. Uh, before I get into it, I, I do want to say I wholeheartedly agree with with the approach that uh, kind of these these combination of active and passive sensing and, and uh, especially capturing behavior is is absolutely critical in kind of understanding what's actually going on. Um, this is kind of a cheat on that. Uh, so this is just using one, one of these things, which is is actigraphy. And you know, act, actigraphy has become very popular. I mean, we've been using it uh, in in the sleep field since the uh, since the late 80s and um, and I, I got involved uh, in, in the mid 90s in, in looking at actigraphy. But you know there, there's lots of lots of different options. But fundamentally, uh, when, when you're looking at an actigraph, you're, you're mainly looking at uh, uh, the collection of triaxial accelerometry. Um, there are many different kinds of devices. I just put up some pictures of a few of them. Um, there are ones that are research grade, there are consumer grades. Um, uh, but basically what it's doing is just measuring how much you're moving in, in three different uh, directions. So um, when it's on the wrist, each direction doesn't have much of a meaning um, because as, as the wrist can rotate, uh, you know, if it's going up, down, left, right, back and forth, uh, you, these things all change based on, on your wrist rotation. But uh, that being said, uh, they all collect various kinds of data, either um, what's going on in a single epoch. Uh, you can look at data collected at 100 hertz. You can look at single axes. Um, uh, 
crossing thresholds, lots of different stuff. But in the end, you're, you're basically getting um, how much movement you've got. And then uh, wh when you do that, you, the next consideration is, well, which one, which device? I mean, I have people come to me all the time and say, well, which device should I use? I say, well, it, you know, it kind of depends on, on what you're looking for. Um, you know, some of them, like the Apple Watch is great, except of course that it lasts less than 24 hours and people have to charge it. So when do they charge it? Well, they charge it during sleep. So if you're interested in sleep, it's probably not the best device. Um, some of them last months. The, some have no memory at all. Some of them, you have to have a phone device, you know, as Dr. K mentioned, uh, and that could be a problem if this is basically not recording on the device at all, but uh, is constantly streaming to a phone. There's all sorts of connectivity issues uh, to other devices last months. Um, some of it, you have access to the raw data. So data that's collected at you know, 60 to 100 hertz. Sometimes it's the process data and sometimes it's only summary data. Um, it, it took me three years to find out from Fitbit to get to the right person there to find out that the reason that we couldn't access the raw data is because it doesn't exist. So Fitbit doesn't actually store any accelerometry data. All of their accelerometry data is converted on the device uh, into proprietary things like steps and movement. Um, data access is also another critical component. Uh, so basically, how are you going to get the data off of the device? Uh, it, do you have to directly download it, which would involve uh, either the, the participant or patient sending in the device or, or physically coming into the office? Uh, or is it available online? You know, is this going to be communicated through uh, your phone and, and that can upload it to the, to the net and then you can download it? And of course, there's all sorts of issues in terms of, well, then who has access to that data? You know, if you're doing it through... Uh, you know, Garmin, does that mean Garmin can see your patient's data? Uh, and then if you're at a place like Stanford, they will tell you right away, that's not going to happen. Uh, you're not going to have, you're not going to be able to do that study. Um, again, there, there's uh, different types of data, which I'll, I'll get into a little later. In addition to movement, there's also a lot of these devices now have uh, photoplethysmography or PPG. Um, uh, and then there's this issue of data density. So, you know, for years we relied on EPOC data collected at 15 seconds. So, so how much activity is in 15 seconds or 30 seconds or 60 seconds? Um, and a lot of that was because even though it was obtained at 60 hertz data, when this stuff started, we didn't have the access to the amount of memory required to store it at 60 hertz. So most of the, um, most of the early stuff in the 90s was really done on, on 30 second data or 15 second data. But now memory is not so much of a problem, so you get the millisecond data. So the question is, well, is that helpful? Um, I, you know, in sleep, we've looked really hard to see if, if it is, and, and no one's really shown that it's that much better than, than the epoch data. Uh, but for example, in movement disorders, it probably could be actually helpful to see this kind of um, uh, kind of higher frequency movements. Uh, and then, as Dr. K mentioned, uh, form factor is always critical. So basically, you can have the best device in the world, but if patients don't like or, or participants don't like how it looks and they don't wear it, well, then that, that's a pretty useless device. Um, so again, there's lots of lots of different options involved. Fundamentally, though, when, when you do uh, collect data, you get data that look like this. Uh, th this, is, this is just some uh, actigraphy data. I, I really want to point out the units are arbitrary units uh, for this. So you can look within a person and compare movement patterns. Uh, you can compare amplitudes within, a per within people, but between people, it's very difficult to get an accurate assessment of triaxial accelerometry. Um, so what's, so here, if this person say, well, you know, they, they're averaging around 300, 350 units, you know, uh, during the daytime, uh, and someone else is averaging, you know, 700 units. So they've got twice as much of activity. And you say, you can't actually do that. That's, that's not an accurate comparison because first of all, you have to, you have to um, uh, take these devices uh, and you have to um, in individually test them to make sure that uh, they're all accurate, which, which often they are not. Uh, and secondly, this is measuring uh, angular movement. So taller people have more movement because their wrist is located further away. And so the, the pendular swing of their arm is longer. So it looks like they're having more movement, but they're actually not having uh, much more movement. It's just they're taller. Uh, so anyway, so I, just as a note that between person comparisons of absolute amplitude uh, can be a bit problematic. So that being said, again, uh, what these kinds of data were originally used for um, in my area was to look at sleep. 
and uh, and mainly the algorithms uh, which are based um, uh, are uh, it's the Cole Kripke algorithm, um, and it's basically saying well if we take a kind of smooth weighted average and, and this is just the example um, of of one of these kinds of smoothing operations uh, that depends on uh, the length of your epoch, uh, basically it says well is the we're going to assume that during a certain period of time, the person's asleep. Uh, and the question is, is well, uh, is the activity of a sufficient amplitude and or duration to indicate that this pro person's probably awake? Um, and, and that's it. I, uh, that, that is the fundamental um, ap uh, algorithm that's being used to determine uh, sleep and wake. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's reasonably good to do this. Um, and it can derive nightly sleep statistics like sleep efficiency uh, or, or wake after sleep onset or total sleep time. Uh, but I do have to know that in order to do that, you have to know when they're in bed. Uh, and so if you're just slapping one of these devices on someone, it's actually really hard to determine when someone is getting into bed in order to initiate sleep. So again, depending on the age of your cohort and the behaviors of your cohort, you know, um, they might have sedentary behavior, which by the way, this can't determine. So, so uh, under the things that this can and cannot do, this cannot uh, discriminate between you know, daytime napping and sedentary behavior. It cannot discriminate between lying in bed, uh, reading a book or lying in bed and watching television and actually being asleep. Um, so you have to know when they are getting into bed with the intention of going to sleep in order to get something like sleep efficiency or how much weight they've had after sleep onset. And so, uh, again, that, that's getting back to Dr. K's talk, and thank you so much. It, it makes my job a lot easier talking after you, um, is, is that having that kind of passive sensing is wonderful. Um, the underbed sensors are great, except, of course, if someone is lying in bed for long periods of time, you don't know when they're trying to initiate sleep. And again, based on movement alone, you cannot tell when someone is sedentary and when someone is asleep. Um, I should note that these kinds of metrics are reasonably accurate in people who are consolidated sleepers. Um, they're not perfect, they're not great, but they are reasonably accurate. Um, but if you've got lots of awakenings, they're really inaccurate. Um, you know, we recently published a study where we were looking at individuals who've had traumatic brain injury uh, and they've got uh, significant sleep-wake disruption. Uh, I, I think really kind of uh, in terms of not in terms of cause, but in terms of pattern, very similar to what you see uh, in, in various kinds of dementias. Um, and when we compared it to polysomnography, polysomnography was saying that, you know, they were getting like three, four hours of sleep. And according to actigraphy, they were getting six to seven hours of sleep. So, so we're not talking about, you know, close. We're talking about way off. And basically it's, it's flip a coin. Half of the sleep episodes uh, that are indicated by polysomnography, or uh, sorry, half the wake episodes that are indicated by polysomnography are not uh, accurately predicted by uh, actigraphy, and then half of the wake episodes predicted by actigraphy are not actually wake episodes by polysomnography. Um, and, and to this point, I, I do want to briefly caution you when you see things like our device is, you know, you know, ninety-five percent accurate uh, compared with polysomnography. And you're like, wow, that, that's amazing. I mean, you know. If I had a device with 95% accurate and I'd have to put on all these electrodes to report sleep, that'd be wonderful. But you gotta be careful because if I had a device that was broken and just said that someone was asleep the entire night and I took a good sleeper who has 95% sleep efficiency, well, that's 95% accurate then. So it's actually an incredibly misleading statistic. It's not the right statistic, but it's the one that people publish because, hey, it's a great way to, to get people to buy a product. So. Um, uh, again, uh, you can't use these to determine uh, latency to sleep. Um, even if someone, even if you know someone writes down in a diary, you've got video recording that they're trying to initiate sleep at a particular time. Um, physiologically speaking, from EEG, it's it's hard enough to determine the difference between uh, you know quiescent wake and stage one of uh, of sleep. Um, and actigraphy, you just can't do it. It's just not a reliable measure. Uh, and again, unfortunately, daytime napping, again, it's very difficult. And, and, and in fact, determining napping is also exceedingly difficult. Again, getting back to Dr. K's talk, you know, even if you're getting self-reports of napping, 
um, you get into conversations like uh, of you with a like an elderly couple and you ask the, the gentleman like, oh, well, you know, do you nap? Um, and he says, no, I never nap. And, and the wife's jaws on the floor like, are you kidding me? You nap all the time. I said, well, that's not napping. That's just taking a little snooze on the couch. It's like, you know, napping for them as well. I don't like get up off the couch, go into the bed and lie down with the intention of taking a half hour nap. No, I say just take, you know, 15, 20 minute naps, you know, six or seven times in the afternoon. So again, um, this unfortunately cannot help to do that. Um, uh, if you don't have a wonderful setup, you can use some information like diaries or phone metadata uh, to help framing the sleep period. Uh, these are not I, I, um, perfect, but uh, again, in terms of um, depending on how much data you can get from people, the, these are opportunities to, to help frame this period. Um, most of the proprietary algorithms that are out there for uh, these devices that are, that are using commercial devices are, are not publicly available. Um, many times they have been um, validated against uh, gold standards like PSG. Often when they do that, they're not uh, validating in, in groups that have highly fragmented sleep. Again, they're, they're validating these things in usually very healthy sleepers. Um, but in the end, it's probably going to be very similar to what you get uh, with, with the research grade actigraphy. Um, People have tried to use things like heart rate, heart rate variability, skin conductance, skin temperature, and there's only truly only marginal improvements uh, in, in sleep detection uh, with these things. Um, it's a couple of percentage points. It's, it's okay, it's nice, statistically significant, physiologically not particularly meaningful. Um, and, and when you see claims of, of being able to get sleep stages out of these devices, um, Again, you can put in lots of cheats. I, I, can, I can design an algorithm uh, to cheat and basically say, okay, um, you should basically determine about like two thirds of the sleep at the beginning of the night should be stage, you know, N3 and a third should be REM. And, and then at the end of the night, you know, you should bias more towards REM. You know, I, so I can put in cheats, but it's, it's not accurately detecting these, these stages. So again, not to say that we couldn't have that at some point, but at this point, I really don't believe much of the data on sleep staging uh, per se. Um, it's, it's a little closer if you just split into non-REM and REM, but even that isn't particularly accurate. You know, they, they uh, when, when you dig down into details, they're like, yeah, 66% of our stages are accurate. It's like, wow, that, that's, 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 that's great. I mean, completely unusable, but nice. So anyway, um, that's kind of where we are. So. Um, that's kind of what people have done traditionally with these kinds of data vis-a-vis -vis sleep. Um, we've been doing a lot of stuff looking at um, what's going on with these data in terms of trying to derive daily statistics. Now, uh, as Dr. Posta mentioned, I'm a circadian biologist, so I, I cannot call these things circadian because truly they are not, but we will call them diurnal, which means that it's a daily rhythm. Um, uh, if you want to get into circadian, that, that's a whole nother conversation, which, which is I could bore you to tears with, but um, you can get lots of interesting information out of daily rhythms. Now, the, the simplest in the traditional model is just to use a cosiner model, uh, which is basically fitting kind of a, a cosine or a sine wave uh, to these data. And you can get lots of interpretable pieces of information. You can get the acrophase or kind of when the peak of activity is. You can get the amplitude. Uh, so kind of the, the half, the distance between the peak and, and the nadir. Um, you can get something called the midline estimating statistic of rhythm or the MISO, which is basically kind of the midline here. Um, so you can get all of these um, and, and, they're, and they're, they're okay. Uh, you know, they, they give you some meaning to, to the data. Um, but frankly, when you look at many of these uh, studies, what people find is when, when you're comparing um, these kinds of statistics, this kind of Cosiner model with various kinds of health outcomes, it's actually the goodness of fit, which is almost always the most important thing. And usually what it's saying is that people who have a poor fit uh, do the worst health-wise. So basically, if you don't look like this, you're not doing well from a health perspective. Um, and so we'll get into a moment uh, in terms of what you can do about that. Um, this kind of, of data has been expanded uh, into a five parameter cosine model, which basically kind of just changes the, the model parameter slightly uh, to make it more of a square wave, which is again, more of a, a traditional uh, kind of fit. Um, so again, and, and even when you look at this, 
really the goodness of fit measures uh, are, are usually the most important when, when it comes to health. Um, and, and as I mentioned, the problem is, is that, you know, this is kind of an average activity pattern um, in, in individuals. But when you look at the individuals that get into that, this is kind of the activity patterns that, that you see over the, over the course of a day. Um, and you can see some of them are, look more, you know, cosine-ish and, and others uh, a little less so. Um, and so the question is, well, well how, how do you quantitate this? Um, you know, a lot of times you can see a pattern and you say, well, I can see that there's a difference between these patterns. Um, but how do you quantitate it? Uh, well, th there are several ways to do this. Um, you know, one of them is using uh, a, a kind of set of non-parametric uh, parameter uh, building models. Uh, these were designed in, uh, in the late 80s uh, in individuals uh, who have uh, Alzheimer's dementia to kind of describe uh, what is very common there. And it's also common uh, in, in various um, uh, Lewy body dementias, which is that, um, you know, the consolidation of sleep and wake starts to fall apart. And the thought is, is that this will happen to everyone eventually. Uh, it's just that it is in a much more accelerated fashion in people uh, with various forms of dementia. Um, and so uh, there are two fairly uh, simple ways uh, to do this. Um, these are non-parametric, so they're not dependent on the uh, on fitting a particular shape. Um, one is basically is called inner daily stability. It's saying, well, how regular is the movement? Uh, so basically, are people awake and asleep at similar times of day every day. Uh, so for example, if you look at a lot of individuals, you'll see, well, yeah, so you know, they're, they're always gonna sleep at 10 o'clock uh, and that would be a, a stable kind of pattern. Uh, but the second part is variability, which, which is how fragmented is the pattern? So if they're always gonna sleep at 10 o'clock, that would be a stable pattern. But if they're waking up six times a night, you're gonna have a lot of variability. Uh, you know, if they're taking um, lots of, uh, of sedentary behavior during the day. Maybe it's a nap, maybe it's just sedentary behavior, I don't know. Um, again, that would increase this kind of fragmentation. Um, and, and this is just uh, some examples. So, um, so here on the left, this is just a, a series of actigraphy plots um, basically stacked on, on top of each other. So this is six days of actigraphy from day one uh, to day six. Uh, and, and you see accelerometer movements uh, and uh, this individual over here is both irregular and not consolidated. You, you can basically see is that uh, you pick a time of day and they might be asleep, they might be awake. Um, there's no regularity to it. There's no consolidation. Um, however, on, on this side, you'll see a person who has very regular activity patterns. Uh, so here, uh, you know, typically going to sleep, um, you know, sometime around, you know, 10 o'clock or so um, on this night a little later, this night a little later, here a little earlier. Um, and then waking up usually at, at the same time and, and having reasonably uh, consolidated sleep uh, during the night. Um, so again, these are the kinds of ways that you can kind of parameterize this. Uh, and then you can build that into various models to say, well, you know, now that we know how uh, fragmented the sleep are, uh, the sleep is or how regular it is, well, does that mean something in terms of the outcome of interest? Um, the other or another way that, that you can do this um, gets into kind of shape analysis, which is um, something that, that we ran into several years ago uh, and a colleague, a colleague of mine at, at WashU developed this, this uh, procedure called functional principle component analysis, which for, for those of you who have more of a psychology background, it's very similar to uh, principle component analysis or PCA, except instead of being done on finite data elements, uh, it is done on equations. Uh, so basically what you do is you have a series of equations, uh, in this case, nine parameter Fourier equations that are basically nonsense equations. Um, so it, it'll fit. Um, so if you've got, say, let's just say you've got 10 days of data in 100 people, um, you would then have 1,000 Fourier equations, one for each day and each individual. Uh, and the equation, because the nine parameter Fourier is kind of a nonsense equation, it, it fits that day's data and it fits it reasonably well. Um, but then you've got this series of a thousand equations, and then you do functional data analysis on this, which basically says, okay, what equations underlie the variance that we see in these equations? And how close are you to this variance? And uh, you get assigned an eigenvalue for that, which you can then use again in standard modeling. Um, and so basically, this is just one example. Uh, this, was, this was looking at actually individuals who have uh, Alzheimer's disease and apathy. Um, 
and the individuals in blue uh, are the ones with apathy and the individuals in red are the ones without apathy. Um, and again, when we looked at this, the average curves were like, well, yeah, that looks different. You know, you, you see both there's this big dip in the middle of the day and then uh, here it looks like they're, you know, what I would probably describe as going to sleep earlier. Um, and so that's what it looks like and I can see it, but can I mathematically prove it? Uh, and that's basically what this is doing. So it, it basically, this is showing uh, the, the principal components uh, and, and you can see here that there's more blue down here, more red up here. So these are from individuals uh, in red are the ones who have Alzheimer's uh, without apathy. The ones in blue have Alzheimer's with apathy. Um, and, and you can basically see clearly, I think, uh, reasonably clearly uh, that, that you have many more individuals down here. And then these curves, again, reduce down to eigenvalues. So you can basically, uh, in this kind of situation, you can just say, okay, let's do a t-test. Are the people, the eigenvalues and the people with apathy different from the eigenvalues of people without apathy? And you can show that, that yes, they are. Um, and, and it's a little less clear here, but again, you'll see there's more blue here and more red here. Um, and so, uh, you can get these kinds of, of differences. So anyway, this is just to show an example of a way to uh, kind of take the shape of the data uh, and then reduce this to a single number that you can then do standard statistics on. Uh, there are lots of other ways that you can do this. Um, uh, these are, are two of them, something called the composite phase deviation, um, uh, which Dorothea Fisher uh, uh, published back in 2016. Uh, and Andrew Phillips uh, did this uh, sleep regularity index in 2017. Um, there, there are pluses and minuses to these. I, I don't use these as often. Uh, the sleep, sleep regularity index is, is picks up a, a kind of a different aspect of the regularity of data. Um, I just like a little less because it depends on accurate scoring of sleep and wake, which, as I mentioned, uh, depending on the population you're looking at, may or may not have uh, face validity. Um, so briefly, just to describe, you know, there are lots of other signals that you can get from these devices now. Instead of just looking at um, uh, at movement, uh, you can get uh, reflectance uh, plethysmography or, or PPG. So, um, you know, most people use transmission plethysmography. So, so you've got um, you know the light going through the finger to pick up uh, oxygen. Uh, you can now use reflectance, uh, which um, is not quite as good as um, uh, as transmission, but it is pretty good. Um, and in fact, might actually be better in some circumstances. Uh, there, was, there was a paper uh, earlier this year in the New England Journal uh, talking about um, skin tone and the failure of transmission uh, plethysmography. Uh, so people with darker skin tones, it actually misestimates how much oxygenation uh, that they have. Um, this actually works a little better for that. So uh, there's some proof of that. You can pick up heart rate, heart rate variability, respiratory rate. They've been promising me blood pressure for the past 10 years. And every year they say, oh, we're really close, we're really close. Theoretically, it totally makes sense, but it's not there yet. So hopefully soon. Um, you can get skin conductance, but frankly, I, I don't know what skin conductance means at the wrist. Uh, you know, skin conductance is a way to look at, people have classically used it usually on the fingertips. It's a way to pick up um, stress or anxiety, basically, uh, the more you're sweating at your fingertips, um, then you're going to have uh, changes in sympathetic activity. Um, and, and so you can pick up sweat and, and ionic uh, conductance that way. Uh, at the wrist, you're not picking that up at all. You're, you're picking up just the local sweating response. Um, and, and so again, I'm not quite sure what that means. Maybe uh, there is some meaning to it in some circumstances. Um, there have been lots of studies here at Stanford as well as elsewhere looking at sweat analysis um, uh, in order to pick up various kinds of metabolites. People can pick up cortisol uh, in, in sweat, um, and it's great, except um, thus far it's really just very short-term duration, um, and, and, and you need to sweat. Um, and so it works reasonably well for short-term exercise studies, but for longer-term analyses, um, it's not quite there yet, but, but it's a very exciting area. And, and I think there's a lot of developments in there. Uh, skin temperature, like skin conductance, uh, I don't think it's particularly meaningful at the wrist. Um, we use skin temperature uh, quite a bit uh, in, in sleep, looking at, uh, at changes in skin temperature as a way to monitor um, 
uh, changes in core temperature and brain temperature. So basically um, skin, te skin te temperature, specifically the, the distal proximal gradient. So if you compare the skin temperature at the chest uh, versus on the hand where you have arteriovenous, arteriovenous anastomoses, uh, you can get active or, or central measures of, um, of thermal regulation. At the wrist, you're getting a local response. So again, I'm not sure how meaningful it is. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you can get high frequency data collection now, where you can sample and save it at more than 30 hertz. Again, not sure if there's a utility yet. In Parkinson's, I would imagine there probably would be. People have designed things for looking at um, kind of not Parkinson's, but kind of induced movement. Uh, so when, when you've got certain antipsychotic drugs that can cause a tremor, you can actually pick that up uh, with this kind of device. Um, uh, and then uh, to pick up again on something Dr. K uh, mentioned is you can do uh, in some devices, they have Bluetooth proximity detection. Um, and so one of the devices acts as a receiver and the other as a transmitter. And so uh, we've used this looking at, um, uh, uh, at, at dyadic patterns in couples as well as in mother infant dyads. Uh, so you can look, you know, being Bluetooth, it's not perfect. It's in fact, highly flawed, but you can get reasonable approximation, like are people in the same bed? Are they in the same room or are they in different rooms? Uh, and, and then kind of um, use that data to look at uh, various ways that people can both help and hinder um, either their partner's sleep or, or, or their child's sleep. So anyway, so these are just some of the other signals that are out there. Um, uh, Trade-offs, again, the more signals you have, the worse your battery life is. Um, and when you have bad battery life, that means you need to charge it. And every time you charge it, there's a really good chance, especially if the patient has dementia, that they forget to put it back on. Even if your patients don't have dementia, there's a really good chance that they don't put the device back on. Um, Real-time data visualization is fantastic. There's all sorts of devices that you can use that you can sit in, in your home, in your office, and you can look at the data in real time. Uh, it uses Bluetooth light uh, to do this, uh, BLE, but it really sucks the battery life again out of your system. And there's a lot of issues with data security uh, and who gets access to that data and who can see the data, um, which, which again, using commercial devices becomes highly problematic, um, at, at least at Stanford and speaking with colleagues at several other universities. Um, this gets into using these consumer grade devices. Um, Again, the data themselves are fine, but you have to ask yourselves questions about the security of the data, um, whether or not you're comfortable with, with the proprietary algorithms that are being used. Uh, and the issue is that if you're doing a study, um, you know, the, they can change the hardware, the firmware, the software. And so you could have data, you might be halfway through a study. And if you're just using kind of off the shelf, you know, you get a Garmin, a Fitbit, whatever, uh, and they change this, well, your data are gonna radically be altered. Uh, they'll call it improved, and maybe it is improved, but now you can't compare, you know, half of your participants with the other half because they were collected on what is ostensibly a different device. Um, Research-grade devices are great. Um, of course, there's a reduced feature set, and they cost a lot of money, a lot more money. You know, we, we can get a, a really good, we validated a really nice device uh, from Huami, which is a, a Chinese company. Uh, we can get these devices for 20 bucks. They're fantastic. Um, uh, as opposed to using a Philips device, which we've used for years, which is great and cost a thousand dollars. And, you know, is the Philips device 50 times better than the, the Chinese one? No, not in terms of the technology. However, the Chinese one, well, that means where the data going, they're going to a server that's not our server. And then we have to download from that server. So in order to use this, we have to have a contract uh, with the company uh, in order to get access to that data. So anyway, uh, lots of options, lots of choices. We are an exciting time. Uh, and, uh, and I think that there's a lot to come down the pike. Uh, so uh, with that, I'll, I'll take my leave and thank you so much, Dr. Posen, and I look forward to some questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jamie. That was fantastic. And, and I learned so much about, about the data that, that uh, we're capturing and the pros and cons. 
Um, so uh, please uh, put your questions in the Q&A um, as we're moving forward. And I'm going to introduce our next speakers. Uh, this is a tag team of uh, Dr. Debbie uh, uh, Sung, who is at the University of Washington, where she's a geriatric uh, psychiatrist, and uh, Dr. Eric St. Louis, who is the director of the Mayo Sleep and Cognitive uh, Neuropsychology Laboratory. I believe, uh, Debbie, you are going first if you wouldn't mind pulling up your slides. And I do apologize, I realize we're quite behind schedule, but I wanna make sure our speakers get a chance to, um, to, uh, to get their information in. Please do put your questions in the Q&A so that we can have that discussion going on while um, our speakers are talking so that we can sort of uh, dual task our, our, our question answer as well as our presentation. So uh, Debbie, take it away. Thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this symposium. And also thank you for the excellent talks that preceded um, this presentation um, that provided the background for um, my presentation. And as uh, Dr. Postner, Poston said, this is gonna be a tag team. First half is I'm gonna talk about a NIA funded R21 study that we're doing here at Puget Sound VA, University of Washington. Um, and then the second half, Dr. Eric St. Louis will present some sleep profiler data that our participants contributed to. So again, thank you. Um, so case study, why, while we were recruiting for the Dementia with Lewy Body Consortium study, um, which were a site, I often uh, encountered patients who don't quite meet DLB criteria. For example, we in my memory disorders clinic, we often saw 70 to 80 year old people with Parkinsonism. So they have rigidity, stoop posture, but no resting tremor. And this gentleman specifically reported RBD. However, he, that he did not have PSG documentation. He did not report visual hallucinations or cognitive fluctuation. He had mild cognitive impairment, but no frank dementia. And this fellow was not interested in undergoing additional invasive or in-hospital diagnostic testing, such as lumbar puncture, DAT scan, or PSG. So assessment, he would not have met, he did not actually meet the McKeith criteria, the fourth uh, consensus conference, and he actually would also would not have also met the D MCI prodromal DLB McKeith at all 2020 criteria. He could have possibly met the possible uh, prodromal DLB, but at this time we were not recruiting for prodromal DLB subjects in our study, the DLBC study, so he was ineligible to participate. And as um, Dr. K and others have mentioned, only about 5% of data in between visits are captured on history. So we thought, what if we had devices that could monitor signs and symptoms in between studies? And we did not have sufficient funding in this R21 to do the fabulous um, uh, CART study monitoring. So we had to rely on the poor man's, as I say, um, um, uh, wearables. So as you all know, DLB symptoms um, are in uh, clinically present and in cognitive dysfunction, fluctuating levels of attention, visual hallucinations, sensitivity to and or sensitivity to neuroleptics, motor dysfunction, autonomic dysfunction, acting out dreams and or other sleep disturbances. And we thought the most feasible to domains to target include sleep and motor functioning, as the other speakers have mentioned previously. And I realize there's a fluctuation that can be measured by EEG, but we did not have, um, uh, uh, we, did, we decided not to spend time targeting that. So these are our aims on our R21 to estimate and compare the distribution of cognitive, motor, sleep, and behavioral monitoring profiles in patients with uh, uh, probable DLB and AD dementia. 
Aim one, this is our R21 two-year funding, is to establish research infrastructure and test the feasibility of, of um, M health biomarker measurements in subjects with probable BLB and AD dementia. And to collect data from subjects with probable DLB and AD, including subjects from AIM-1 using medical grade actigraphy and sleep profiler wearable sensors, informant interviews and clinical assessments and motor and function, motor function and cognition. And using AIM-2 data, compare individual and composite profiles of probable DLB versus AD dementia. So uh, in talking with my Mayo Clinic colleagues in sleep, um, they, they were in the middle of um, validating a sleep profiler that can be worn at home uh, um, with advanced brain monitoring company, which records EEG, EOG, EMG with some mental leads. So in our study, our subjects wore to this uh, profiler two consecutive nights every six months. And uh, I will have Dr. St. Louis talk about accuracy. It's equivalent to PSG-based um, manual staging. And the measures REM, N3, and sleep latency. So this is the sleep profiler and how it looks. You wear it as a headband and it initially once the data is uploaded, there's auto staging um, by uh, the company. And then subsequently, the Dr. St. Louis would read and uh, uh, validate it with expert eyes. And so it could pick up awake state, REM, N1, N2, and N3. So, and then we also, um, our subjects also worn a medical grade actigraphy. They wore this device for two weeks during day and night every six months. And uh, uh, we've seen this uh, from the previous speaker. And instead of letting people taking it off to charge, we actually taped it on. So uh, basically the subjects couldn't take it off and it would last um, that duration for two weeks. And we wanted to detect um, subtle functional decline in walking pace, number of steps, distance cover, and day-night reversal. Those are our, our targets. Um, and enrollment status as of um, July 31, 2021, um, we had initially scheduled our first two participants the week of March 15, 2020. And guess what happened then? <laughs> we then had to convert to no in-person in visits. So we were able to rapidly pivot to remote telehealth visits as of April 31, 2020. And the sleep profiler data that were will be included in a larger study that will be presented by Dr. St. Louis. Oh, sorry about that. I was just gonna show you, we have four Alzheimer's disease and five dementia with Lewy body participants. And there's some age discrepancy uh, differences. Baseline MOCA, the Alzheimer's patients were had higher MOCAs and they had lower CDR. So they were more functioning, functional. And our analysis plan, I don't have any data to show you today, but I hope we will in the next year. Uh, the analysis plan is to compare both individual measures as well as composite scores at baseline between groups adjusted for age, MOCA, and CDR scores. And I know our sample size is small, um, but we're hoping to get um, it, double our sample size in the next uh, uh, two months. So we will evaluate and assemble two sets of composite scores based on the traditional measures that are clinical and that we use clinically and and secondly, to augment the composite scores, including the novel passive monitoring measures. And because we will have about a thousand data points, we needed to um, uh, uh, complete a parsimonious subset to get, 
to be selected using likelihood penalization via the lasso or an elastic net analysis. And we will uh, assess optimization in the area under the curve estimates by bootstrapping. So this is a, a receiver operating curve and the blue diagonal line shows some uh, random criteria. Um, so we're hypothesizing that um, traditional measures will improve the accuracy of diagnosis, the yellow line, and then furthermore, actigraphy or sleep profiler data will further increase the diagnostic accuracy um, in the pink line. And then finally, we're anticipating composite score will be the best um, diagnostic utility, provide the best. So this is um, my research group and collaborators. As you can see, we have a big team um, and it's, it's a lot of work <laughs> essentially. And I want to thank all my research coordinators, the clinical team, uh, the sleep profiler team and the biostat team. And as I mentioned, this is funded by the NIA with the R21. And after we reach the go, no go criteria in the spring, we are planning to apply for the extension uh, in, that's called the R33, at which time we hope to move the most predictive, helpful measures to prodromal AD and DLB. And this is our way of hope. Uh, we hope that these measures will translate to that group so that they could be included um, in uh, future clinical trials for early treatment and early diagnosis of DLB. And we'd like to thank the LBDA and the DLB AD study participants and their caregivers for taking part in this study. And here's a picture of our typical Zoom meeting of the research team. So uh, I'd like to thank all of them for their active and dedicated participation, especially during this challenging pandemic times. So thank you very much. Thank you. And so, uh, Perfect. And uh, Dr. St. Louis, if you, perfect, pull your slides up. Great. Thanks. Well, uh, thank you very much. Um, it's you're, my... You're not in, if you could just uh, do this um, up on the left the display settings and click on that and it should give you a swap option. We were seeing the, um, yeah, swap presenter mode. There you go. Click on that. Perfect. Okay, now we can see the slides. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for that guidance, and uh, thank you. It's an honor and a pleasure uh, to uh, to be included in today's symposium. I'd like to thank the organizers and Dr. Swang for the invitation uh, to be with you. And I'll uh, speak uh, here briefly with regard to sleep phenotyping in uh, Lewy body diseases, uh, with focus on, of course, dementia with Lewy bodies, and also some findings that are germane to this uh, from uh, the model of isolated REM sleep behavior disorder. Um, my disclosures are the following, really um, uh, limited to sources of research support for uh, the data you'll see presented from uh, NIH, including uh, the National Institutes of Aging and the NINDS. <clears throat> so a very quick overview of today's uh, uh, topics. I'll present brief uh, background on sleep disturbances in dementia with Lewy bodies, and then focus on some of the novel uh, metrics and uh, candidate uh, biomarkers uh, from uh, wearables, particularly uh, those seen in the sleep profiler uh, with regard to uh, the Lewy body diseases. And this will include uh, atypical N3 or slow wave sleep, uh, REM sleep without atonia, uh, the neurophysiologic substrate of REM sleep behavior disorder, and the analogous but distinct finding of non-REM sleep with hypertonia. 
Uh, so by way of background, I think uh, this uh, audience uh, knows well that sleep disturbances are quite common in dementia with Lewy bodies. Uh, shown here is data from uh, a, a large cohort of polysomnography studied patients with dementia with Lewy bodies. Uh, and this uh, study found that uh, REM sleep behavior disorder, a core diagnostic feature of dementia with Lewy bodies is present in about 80 to 85% of subjects. Also seen frequently is comorbid obstructive sleep apnea seen in the majority, uh, periodic leg movements of sleep, and also uh, spontaneous arousals that serve to fragment sleep. Uh, consequently, sleep efficiency, which is the time uh, asleep relative to time in bed is quite poor uh, in this patient population. Now, as a reminder, uh, all of us go through sequences of non-rapid eye movement, that is non-REM sleep of varying depths, alternating with rapid eye movement or REM sleep in about four or five cycles per night. And you can see from this graphic of a standard hypnogram in a normal subject that uh, most of the non-REM sleep, particularly of slow wave depth, is seen in the first third to half of the night. And then in the second half of the night, rapid eye movement or REM sleep is, uh, is more frequent. Now sleep is staged in 30 second epochs by the standard technique of polysomnography and also by the sleep profiler as defined by graphal elements uh, that define the different uh, states. And I'm not gonna go through them all today in interest of time, but we'll emphasize relevant to our talk today, you can see in the second line on the right side of the slide that REM sleep has the lowest degree of muscle activity, a state known as uh, physiologic atonia, or skeletal muscle paralysis, which is an active property of REM sleep in normal sleepers. Uh, also slow wave sleep we'll uh, discuss today. And this is characterized by high voltage, slow frequency oscillations and the delta frequency band. Uh, this is in the band of uh, zero to four Hertz. Uh, and there you see typical high voltage slow waves as would be seen on a polysomnogram in normal M3 or slow wave sleep. Now, the data I'll present uh, is uh, resulting from a consortium of academic medical centers, which includes uh, Dr. Swang's at the University of Washington's preliminary data from our R21 grant, uh, also data from Mayo Clinic with some of our patients, and a broad consortium of other uh, uh, academic uh, centers. And I, I give special uh, shout out and gratitude to Mr. Dan Lewandowski, our collaborator at Advanced Brain Monitoring, who graciously shared this uh, data that was recently presented at the American Academy of Neurology meeting uh, a few months back. Now, the data uh, from this data set uh, <clears throat> so far includes uh, patients with clinically defined synucleinopathies or suspected synucleinopathy subtypes, including Parkinson disease, isolated REM sleep behavior disorder, which is the prodromal state to Parkinson disease or dementia with Lewy bodies, as well as a subgroup with dementia with Lewy bodies and Parkinson disease dementia. By contrast, as a comparator group, we have a non-synuclean group, including those with normal cognition, a mild cognitive impairment, and Alzheimer's disease. Uh, all were studied with the sleep profiler, and as pointed out by Dr. Swang, this is a wearable uh, that includes the key elements uh, for staging sleep, and uh, the device performs uh, quite accurate and uh, well-validated against polysomnography automated scoring of sleep stages. There you can see the subject also has an added chin EMG, which is being explored in these studies, and it has the ability to plug in an arm EMG as well, for which I'll show you some pilot data of interest to REM sleep behavior disorder populations. Now, one of the advantages of automatic staging is it can discern some uh, elements of EEG frequency not readily discernible to standard visual uh, sleep state inspection. Uh, you can see perhaps some subtle differences in the top lines of each of the top and bottom panels showing the EEG is recorded from frontal polar leads. And there's more polymorphic delta, as well as change in the ratio of other key frequency ranges that characterized atypical N3 sleep, uh, distinguishable from normal uh, physiologic N3 sleep. Uh, this atypical N3 was first uh, noted both visually as well as in automatically staged studies using sleep profiler in an encephalopop 
encephalopathic population in the ICU and subsequently carried forward into studies uh, of patients uh, with neurodegenerative disease including uh, our uh, preliminary pilot data here uh, from the cohort of uh, the multicenter uh, uh, study I described. Uh, here you can see that atypical N3 sleep as a percentage of sleep time is much uh, greater in frequency in those with dementia with Lewy bodies and Parkinson's disease dementia in contrast to Alzheimer's disease or uh, other synuclein and non-synuclein subtypes. If one looks at the odds ratio uh, of the odds of, uh, of atypical N3 sleep in dementia with Lewy bodies or Parkinson's disease dementia, one sees uh, highly greater odds of this finding uh, in distinction to Alzheimer disease, uh, MCI, RBD, uh, PD, and controls, uh, highly significantly so in most of those subgroups. And you note that the uh, Alzheimer's disease uh, uh, odds difference is not yet significant. Uh, we hope with further uh, study that this will uh, prove to uh, either be a positive or negative finding, but it looks very promising uh, to date. Now I'd like to shift uh, focus to perhaps a more familiar biomarker to many of you, that is uh, the polysomnographic marker of REM sleep without atonia. Uh, these are polysomnogram epics shown in the top and bottom panel. In the bottom panel, one sees normal levels of REM sleep atonia or paralysis. And by contrast, the arrows in the top panel show uh, excessive bursts of phasic muscle activity, which can be quantified uh, to uh, determine the level of abnormal muscle activity. And uh, when doing so between patient populations with REM sleep behavior disorder or controls, uh, one sees a significantly greater amount of diagnostic REM sleep without atonia on polysomnography in those with REM sleep behavior disorder. Uh, data here shown is from the NIA-funded North American Prodromal Synucleinopathy Consortium study, uh, now expanded up to about 120 subjects. Uh, and these are adults with REM sleep behavior disorder versus a normative sample of controls. Um, we've extended this uh, finding of REM sleep without atonia to those without REM sleep behavior disorder as well in synucleinopathy populations. So that uh, RSWA or RISWA uh, does appear to be significantly greater in synucleinopathy populations, uh, regardless of whether REM sleep behavior disorder is present or not. That is to say, uh, RISWA may be a covert biomarker uh, found on polysomnography and distinction to these non-synucleinopathy subtypes. Now, uh, a challenge for uh, studying REM sleep without atonia in DLB and other Lewy body uh, disease populations has been it relies on in-laboratory polysomnography. Uh, but here I show preliminary data that appears quite promising for a strong correlation uh, between polysomnography recorded ARM uh, phasic EMG RISWA versus ARM EMG blindedly scored and uh, uh, recorded by the sleep profiler. Now, these were done uh, in laboratory, but shows, I believe, strong proof of concept for the ability for a wearable uh, to capture uh, REM sleep without atonia in the field. An analogous finding that we've recently studied is that of non-REM sleep with hypertonia. Uh, a limitation for the polysomnographic study of this phenomena has been scale. And there's a lot more non-REM sleep than REM sleep through the night. So not much attention or scoring has been done formally for non-REM sleep motor findings uh, in general. Uh, the uh, ability of the sleep profiler to automatically identify this activity has been a real advent. And here you can see in this uh, somewhat busy slide in the lower panel, uh, you can see some fast frequency activity superimposed over the frontal polar EEG channels, which does represent uh, the uh, excess muscle activity as recorded from frontal polar leads. Now, if you uh, look down to the fifth line and uh, focus and squint a bit to look at the uh, arrows and the increased black lines, this is showing the EMG power relative to other frequencies during non-REM sleep. And so one may actually automatically identify these surges of non-REM sleep hypertonia, which appear distinct uh, from that of REM sleep without atonia, but also uh, perhaps somewhat related. 
Uh, like the REM sleep without atonia, the interesting finding here has been the non-REM sleep with hypertonia uh, is clearly distinct in synucleinopathy groups as versus uh, those without a synucleinopathy. Uh, one you see here is much greater uh, levels of non-REM sleep hypertonia in the DLB-PDD REM sleep behavior disorder and Parkinson's disease populations as compared to their non-synucleinopathy uh, groups and controls. Uh, when one constructs an ROC uh, curve, you can see uh, a strong distinction with a good area under the curve of about 0.8 for the odds of synuclein uh, groups having abnormal sleep, uh, non-REM sleep hypertonia in comparison to the non-synucleinopathy groups. So in this very brief uh, tour of uh, sleep uh, phenotyping by wearables, we've uh, reviewed that sleep disturbances, particularly REM sleep behavior disorder, are especially common in dementia with Lewy body populations, as well as other Lewy body diseases. And that the synucleinopathies, including DLB, have distinct sleep neurophysiologic profiles that can be reliably captured uh, by wearable devices, including the findings of atypical N3 sleep, REM sleep without atonia, non-REM sleep with hypertonia. Again, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Lewandowski for sharing uh, this multi-center data, uh, my collaborator, uh, Debbie Swang, and uh, Brad Bovey at Mayo Clinic, my uh, chief collaborator, uh, in addition to our folks in the lab who do all the work. So thank you for your attention. And uh, I realize time is limited. Please uh, feel free to direct any questions to me at the email shown. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. St. Louis. I really appreciate it. So uh, we are going to do a, a brief uh, live uh, Q&A. Uh, I know we're running a little bit behind schedule and I don't wanna run into too much with our afternoon speakers, but we did wanna give some opportunity for discussion. Uh, Dr. St. Louis, if you wouldn't mind unsharing your screen and if we could have our morning speakers, please come off of uh, or, or uh, turn on their, their video. Um, I'm gonna hand things over to, to Joe to direct some, some Q&A. And again, if you would like to speak yourself, um, please uh, raise your hand. Great, that was, that was a wonderful <clears throat> uh, series of talks. Um, I think some of you uh, have seen in the, in the chat box answer to a number of questions. I'm not going to repeat those. Uh, and uh, one repeated question was whether the slides or presentations are going to be available. And again, this is recorded and will be available to everybody tomorrow. Um, but I thought th there were a few questions we might ask in common of, of the panelists with the uh, idea that the overall goal here is to think about what, which of these measures we might want to include in, in uh, clinical trials in, in Lewy body dementia. So um, I wonder if I could invite folks to um, comment on the confounding effects of, of uh, neuroactive medicine. So, so there, were, there were several questions about cholinesterase inhibitors and EEG, but um, maybe Dr. Bonani could start and, and talk about not only cholinesterase inhibitors, but maybe the effects of other medications on these outcome measures. Yes, thank you for the question. Actually, I've seen also the question in the question and answer uh, box. Um, there is a, um, an influence by cholinesterase inhibitors on uh, uh, dominant frequency variability. Actually, they can reverse the uh, increase in dominant frequency variability in patients with fluctuating cognitions. It was published uh, very early in 2003, actually, by our groups. So um, basically, it's definitely the cholinergic pathway is involved. The problem is that um, with cholinesterase inhibitors is that while they are active on EEG, they cannot revert, at least in our experience, the fluctuating cognitions. So there must be something more complex uh, related to the appearance of the uh, phenotype um, than, than, than of the uh, EEG uh, pattern. So that, that, that's one thing. Uh, our study were um, all um, performed in patients naive from medications. So they were all uh, de novo patients without cholinesterase inhibitors uh, treatment. Okay. So this is one of the, uh, the way to, um, to overcome the problem. But, but still, I mean, if we, we believe is there is an cholinergic pathway involvement which is what we, we think that you know, EEG is actually influenced by uh, cholinesterase inhibitors um, and they don't uh, act on uh, 
fluctuations, definitely there's more, there must be something else uh, under the, the phenotype. Any thoughts about other neurotransmitters like uh, um, dopaminergic medicines, neuroadrenergic medicines? We're going to be using those in these patients. And... Yeah, the, those ones that did, did not uh, seem to um, influence the uh, this uh, at least these mathematical descriptors, the dominant frequency and variability. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think there are more, um, some, some some papers and works by Claudio Babiloni uh, mm -hmm. on levodopa uh, actually influence on EEG patterns, but he looked at different uh, quantitative uh, mathematical descriptors. So right. that, that, that's one of the problems, you know, I did, like the analysis that you performed uh, sometimes can can be a bias or uh, something that can, you know, be different in uh, in some way to interpret the results. Uh, this, this is a why you know we need the standardization of uh, analysis uh, between centers. Okay, great, Jeff. You presented some nice data on on levodopa effects. Do, do you want to comment on on um, on that or or other uh, medication effects? Sure. Um, so I think uh, medications are grossly underestimated uh, in our populations. Um, you know, we check in a clinic visit, these medication lists, and I think we all have the experience of patients sort of either saying, yeah, I take that or I don't, or, and, and we really, really don't know what happens uh, actually at home. Uh, we know from our uh, electronic pillbox uh, data that uh, people don't adhere to the medication regimens as they report in the clinic. Um, and then, you know, specifically regarding, um, uh, for example, sleep, um, you know, something like one out of every three older adults takes a sleep medication, um, whether it's prescription or non, and that non may be something like melatonin, which could affect your, um, you know, your patterns of sleep. Um, and, and, and typically in studies, we often exclude, or sometimes we exclude people on these medications. So I think that there's a lot we need to do. Um, that's why, you know, this weekly, it's been really instructive this weekly asking, have you changed your medications? Um, it's remarkable how often people re report these changes uh, week mm -hmm. to week, and they're never reflected in the medical record. Great, thank you. Doc Dr. Seitzer, did you want to comment on effects on actigraphy or? Um, you know, in terms of medication effects, I, I, I don't have anything to, to add. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, Debbie or, or, or Dr. St. Louis, um, in the sleep profile or the uh, additional actigraphy work that you did there? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll just uh, mention that in addition to uh, what Dr. Banani uh, discussed with regard to EEG uh, frequency effects that uh, antidepressants in particular, uh, especially the SSRIs are uh, potentially a confound when it comes to the interpretation of REM sleep without atonia, and potentially that of this novel non-REM sleep hypertonia phenomena. Don't think we have enough experience yet there to say what the medication confound may be, but there's, there's fair data from polysomnography at least that the antidepressants would represent the major concern, and uh, what they do is promote this finding of REM sleep atonia loss. Uh, so you see greater quantities of REM sleep without atonia in the setting of medications. Uh, that said, uh, disease is disease. So in studies that we've conducted, we have found that the levels of REM sleep without atonia in a diseased patient on an antidepressant are similar to a diseased patient's off an antidepressant. And um, I'd like to add to what Eric has to say. We had to exclude quite a few patients due to their medication use. Huh. For example, okay. opiates, antidepressants, sedative, sed, uh, you know, any other over-the-counter sedative hypnotics. So that was, uh, you know, we obviously want to study the pure disease state, right. but we can't get at that because so our patients are on 15 different medications for all their comorbidities. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, that was, is one of the reasons for our low recruitment numbers. Okay. All right, great. Well, that's, that's very helpful. You know, another issue that sort of cuts across all of these measurements and is relevant to clinical trials is how sensitive these measures are to disease change uh, over time. Uh, and obviously that's going to be confounded by, by medications, but um, we also didn't hear too, too much about uh, how, how sensitive these measures are over time. So 
Uh, maybe Dr. Bahani could start by telling us uh, what we know about that with respect to quantitative EEG. You might be muted, I'm not hearing you. Um, she's muted. She's, <laughs> Dr. Banani, you're muted. Yes, I'm sorry. I think okay. I lost my. I lost the question. Sorry. So, so what I was uh, inviting everyone to comment on briefly is um, sensitivity of their measurement to disease change over time. Right. If we're going to incorporate this as yeah. an outcome measure in clinical trials, that's going to be important for us to know. Yeah. And I'm wondering what we know about that with respect to EEG. Yeah, actually, the uh, quantification of EEG as measured by the parameters that I showed, like the dominant frequency, dominant frequency variability, were uh, mostly sensitive in the early phase of the disease, actually in the first two years uh, from the diagnosis of dementia. So it became less sensitive and spe actually less specific uh, after two years because uh, also Alzheimer's disease starts to have slowing even in the occipital derivation after two years. So uh, like the EEG becomes too disrupted uh, to uh, differentiate the different neurodegenerative diseases. So basically it's, uh, the, it, it's, it can be like a very early um, biomarker. Uh, so even a prognostic biomarker. So it would be good to uh, include patients in the trials and especially to avoid to uh, include uh, DLB patients into AD uh, focused clinical trials. So it's more something uh, that is um, interesting at the very early stage of the, of the disease then for as a progressive uh, biomarker for the progression of the disease. Okay, very helpful. So if you've got such a range of, I, I'm sorry, um, Kathleen, did you want to interrupt? Or no. was it Betty? I'm not sure who. Yeah, um, okay. De yeah. Debbie here. Um, okay. So I think we're going to have to do prospective cohort studies to answer these kind of questions. And so for R33, if we get funded, we're planning on getting MCI prodromal patients and follow them every six months. So okay. we will hopefully ca yeah. capture their conversion to dementia as well as the decline. So I think we need those kind of studies to help us, Ander. I, I see Nina had a question about how many years in advance do you think we might be able to detect these sleep abnormalities? So we're gonna have to do future studies. And I think Jeff's, Jeff's um, have collected, has collected a lot of data too that can answer about progression. Yeah, let's hear from Jeff. Yeah. If oh. I can add a comment, uh, actually our data on MCI patients with uh, like one core feature of DLB. So the, we were like, we, we, we defined those patients as early or prodromal DLB before the definition of research criteria last year. So it was like a, uh, an earlier study. Basically what we found is that uh, some of them, of course, uh, in three years follow up did not convert, but if they had, an EEG pattern of DLB at the MCI stage and they will convert to dementia, they will become a DLB. So basically the specificity will be very good. So this is you know, one, one thing that made it, made it like a, a good prognostic biomarker. Excellent. So uh, I, um, go ahead. I may just chime in on that as well, if we, uh, right from a polysomnography standpoint, and you know, the, as a, a resource intensive and expensive resource, this has been a real limitation for the field and gathering the kind of prospective longitudinal data that's needed uh, with serial sampling. So mo most of what we know by uh, about the polysomnographic contrast between these populations are from cross-sectional data and not from the kind of high quality prospective longitudinal studies that will be necessary to define the temporal evolution of these changes over time. Uh, one of the key goals of the NAPS or North American Prodromal Synucleinopathy Consortium study is serial polysomnography uh, as one of our key aims. So we're hoping that we get a bit of longitudinal data from that uh, uh, study over the next five years. So uh, I, I might make a couple comments here. Uh, so we have, have been fortunate to have monitored um, uh, people, uh, cohorts of uh, about 100 uh, on average people for um, 
up to seven years uh, and uh, have had people convert from normal to mild cognitive impairment uh, and have shown that, um, uh, for example, um, uh, walking speed, walking speed variability, uh, time on the computer, time of day on the computer, uh, time uh, when people uh, typically answer the questionnaire, <laughs> weekly questionnaire, um, room transition patterns change uh, predictably uh, in groups as people develop MCI and these, and as well as uh, what I, I would call nighttime behavior. I think uh, Dr. Zeitzer made an important point that really what we're measuring is, um, uh, we call it sleep, but it's really, uh, I, I would say bedtime, nighttime behavior. But these uh, have been shown to uh, prospectively change uh, in general, actually, it's about the detection using the methodologies uh, that we described or somewhere about three years prior to the diagnosis of MCI. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, the, I guess the other big question is, you know, change to what? So we, we're reporting people changing to a, a clinical diagnosis. Um, you know, ultimately, the question is, what's the underlying pathology? Um, and so that's, that's a bigger issue. Um, fortunately, I think you know, some of these blood-based biomarkers may simplify this working you know, in the field. Uh, again, just bringing in people for amyloid PET scans or other kinds of scans is very, it's, it gets us back to the same place we were before, but if we can be more uh, in the field, we may be able to get some more uh, pathologic or other sur surrogate information. I, I, I actually was interested in asking the question myself about um, the uh, amyloids, the cortical amyloid status of people with Lewy body dementia and these um, EEG measures, um, uh, because it, it's a, you know, it, it's a fascinating, in some ways a disconnect, um, because you would expect people with Lewy body disease who presumably have quite, can have quite a bit of cortical amyloid, um, don't look like people with Alzheimer's disease. Um, great question, uh, and I think part of that was answered in the in the chat box. You might have might have seen that, um, Jeff. That uh, the the data is a little bit lacking, uh, apparently, on on biomarker confirmed <clears throat> pure Lewy body versus uh, Lewy body plus uh, amyloid. Um, uh, you, you know, I, I know we, we have to be careful about time, but I want to just ask uh, or throw throw out one more sort of general question for everybody, and and that is uh, an issue that um, Kathleen mentioned at the beginning of of the talks, which is. You know, which of these are ready for prime time? Which, 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 what of these could we conceivably incorporate into a clinical trial for Lewy body dementia in the next year or so? And, and maybe I'll ask Dr. Zeitzer to start since um, we, we didn't give him uh, much airtime yet. Oh, no worries, no worries. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you know, the actigraphy is totally ready. It, it can go out there. It's just a question of, you know, what measures are you going to use? And, and I, I think the important thing is really selecting the measures that are going to reflect the behavior that you're trying to capture. Um, and, and I think just, you know, again, using standard sleep ones may not be the best approach uh, for that. Other comments? Well, I'll, I'll certainly not be shy to pipe <laughs> in here that the CAR platform, which the uh, NIA and the VA invested in, is, is ready to be used in research today and is being used, and actually by some of my colleagues here on this, uh, in the symposium. Um, so I would encourage people to use the platform. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, getting back to what uh, Dr. Zeitzer said, that, you know, you don't necessarily need every, uh, every biomarker, digital biomarker. You, it has to be guided by the, the uh, use case. What are the outcome measures that are considered most important for the studies as design? Other comments? All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, I, I, I know the problem with these uh, interesting topics is we always go over time. So I think we're going to have to um, uh, move on. Kathleen, do you want to tell us what the plan is for that? Yes, absolutely. So um, just one second here. Uh, you guys wrapped up in perfect timing. So our afternoon session uh, is going to be, um, again, focused on, um, on cognitive and 
uh, motor aspects of uh, dementia with uh, Lewy bodies. And I'm just going to pull this up really quickly. So we're going to start right now with our first speaker, but just to sort of go through the um, the afternoon or the, the later, later afternoon for some of you. Um, so focusing on cognitive and motor uh, biomarkers, um, I'm going to ask the speakers to please try to keep to their uh, 20 minutes as best as possible. Our first speaker, um, if you wouldn't mind, Kristen, pulling up your, your slides, is uh, Kristen Taylor, who is going to talk to us talk about ready for prime time talk about uh, data that has been um, been acquired uh, by Roche um, through the remote um, and frequent quantification of motor sign severity in individuals uh, with Parkinson's disease so giving us a sense of what is actually being done out there um, in industry uh, sponsored studies uh, with this regard so thank you so much for joining us and take it away Kristen. Thank you very much, Dr. Poston, for um, the opportunity to come here. Uh, it's really an honor to be part of this symposium. And so, yes, we'd like to talk to you about our experience with the um, mobile application that we're using uh, in our clinical trials for the remote and frequent quantification of motor sign severity. And um, all of the individuals and all of the patients in our trials uh, do have Parkinson's disease. So I disclose I am a full-time employee of F. Hoffman La Roche. It's here in beautiful Basel, Switzerland um, headquarter. So um, I'll be showing you data from a great team of scientists that you see in the blue, block, blue box up here. And of course, we, I also want to take the opportunity to thank all of the study participants and their families, as well as the investigators and the study group. So of course, it takes a, a huge, huge village to get something like this done. So I, we all know why we're here, right? But in Parkinson's disease, uh, it's, it has, of course, notoriously uh, fluctuating in, in nature. So patients will have um, quite severe symptoms one day, less severe symptoms the other day. Um, and this becomes difficult, not just for the benchmarking of disease severity, but as Dr. Quinn pointed out, how about tracking progression over time. So this variability is extremely difficult. Our job in pharma is to understand, is the drug working like, to, like it's expected to, yes or no? And if yes, wonderful. If no, let's please stop it as, this trial as soon as possible and invest in something else. So we really need very robust measures of disease progression. And these considerations led Roche to develop together with um, an academic experts, a first digital biomarker that was deployed in a phase 1B study of prosonezumab, which is a uh, humanized monoclonal antibody targeting the C-terminus of aggregated alpha-synuclein. Um, this study or this digital biomarker was also deployed in an independent study with 35 healthy control participants that were age and gender matched to the um, Parkinson's patients in the phase 1B trial. And basically, all participants were provided with a phone and they were asked to perform six simple, uh, what we call active tests every morning. So the same tests every morning, sustained venation, rest and postural tremor tasks, dexterity, so finger tapping, a balance task, and walking. And when they were done, they simply were, were uh, instructed to put the phones in their pockets and go about their daily lives. And of course, this is what we're calling in the session passive monitoring. And throughout, as you might expect, the smartphone sensors were sampling um, motor behavior, let's say, throughout the day, so um, at about 50 hertz. We had a system whereby um, these were provisioned phones. So these weren't the patient's own or participant's own phones. Um, so everything was locked down and secure. And when the phones were connected to Wi-Fi, data transfer occurred to our secure servers and were downloaded and analyzed in-house. We were actually quite happy with the adherence that we saw in this study. Um, so you see that even at six months, so 25 weeks, uh, patients were still completing um, about half uh, or all of the active tests on half of the days per week. But we just kind of like to give you a flavor here of what the kinds, the kinds of things we were seeing. And this is coming from an accelerometer um, during a rest tremor task. So with the participant holding the phone in their hand lightly with the, um, with, with the arm resting on the thigh. So you see 
almost no movement in the healthy control, almost no movement in patient one with an MDSU PDRS total score of seven, but quite a different pattern of movements in these patients two and three with more advanced, slightly more advanced Parkinson's disease. And so what we did in terms of um, validating this initial version of the digital biomarker was to um, aggregate our sensor features. So like the sensor feature you saw on the slide previously, we would aggregate all of the sensor features that were collected within a two week period. And this is to make them of course more reliable and then compare them with the physician's ratings of the symptom severity at the site visit. And this is what you see on the x-axis and all of, all of the graphs, uh, bar graphs that you see will follow this format. MDSU Peter S scale, of course, that's a five point scale, zero to four, four being most severe, one sh meaning no signs, motor signs at the site visit. We also show for comparison, a healthy control participant. So for this test and all of our other motor tests in this, on this um, version, um, we showed strong correlations between the sensor feature, which had been aggregated over two weeks, and the corresponding um, item, MDS ubiquitous item score from the clinic. But what we what I'd like you to really zoom in on here is is what what about those patients that received a score of zero at the site visit? Now, because we are able to um, have a remote assessments, because we are testing every day. We are here, we think, picking up on the fluctuating nature of these motor signs. So indeed, we are finding uh, levels of impairment that significantly differ from healthy control subjects in terms of their sensor values for rest tremor, and indeed are at times as high as those that had um, MDSU period rest item scores of four. So an another interesting, so for us, really important part of the solution that that was initially deployed was what we called the, well, the passing passive monitoring data. And you see from the gyroscope and accelerometer, you see the kinds of data that the you know, standard consumer uh, smartphones are giving us. And this is my colleague, Florian Lipsmeyer. He's walking the halls of the Munich office. And it's great, right? Because we have a time yoked video, we know what he's doing. But what about all the passive monitoring data from our trial? How were we to know what patients were doing at any given moment in time so that we can analyze it and make sense out of it? And towards this end, the, the team trained a machine with um, 50 hours of pu publicly available, um, let's say, actigraphy data. So data from smartphone sensors, from individuals who had gone about their daily lives and then just had written down what they were doing at any given moment. So now I'm walking, now I'm sitting, now I'm climbing stairs, et cetera. So this was a human activ activity recognition model that was successful. We validated it on an independent data set. And then we fed in all of the passive monitoring data from the phase B1, tr 1, tr B trial. And afterwards we had these lovely categorized segments of passive monitoring data where we knew, for example, in this example, um, the individual had been sitting down and had stood up and begun to walk. And using this approach, we, we were able to get some indication of how um, Parkinson's disease was affecting the daily lives of these patients. So compared to our age and dem our demographically matched cohort. So we saw walking activity levels were much lower in patients compared to controls, uh, fewer sit to stand transitions and uh, fewer turns while walking. And um, of course, this could be a cohort effect, but at the same time, we see that the, um, the data or the values of the sensor features, passive sensor features, also correlated with in-clinic scores like the postural instability and gait disorder score uh, on the subscore of the MDSU PDRS. So there are a lot of learnings. That was perhaps one of our biggest learning is to go in early with something, gather some data, gather some experience, not just operationally, also analyzing the data, which tasks appear to be working, which appear don't to be, uh, not to be working. Of course, we also analyzed then PPMI data. Uh, we looked into literature. We spoke with movement disorder specialists, most notably Ron Postuma. We spoke with patients and based on the integration of all this information, we developed the uh, mobile application version two, which is much more enriched with measures of bradykinesia that is so important in an early stage population. But we also added tasks like uh, speech where uh, participants read a sentence that is written on the phone out loud and then answer that question out loud. 
Uh, we also have, um, so here the draw shape and hand turning are two additional measures of bradykinesia. Uh, we saw the gait task was not that informative in our, in our population. And so we turned it into a U-turn task. And we did include the uh, digi a digital version of the symbol digit modalities test. And to increase our coverage of passive monitoring, we then we also gave participants a smart watch in addition to the smartphone to ensure really we were getting as much coverage as possible um, uh, for passive monitoring analyses. So this um, procedure was deployed into the phase two study of um, Pasadena of prazanezumab uh, with individuals with early PD. So zero to two years post the diagnosis, that spec confirmed hernan yars stages one or two. And I'll be showing you data from the first part one, which is the first 52 week double blind uh, treatment placebo controlled portion of the trial. Here, very briefly, you see, um, I hope it's not too small, but the groups are, are well balanced with respect to um, clinical and demographic characteristics. You see also from the MDS UPDRS scores, total scores, so placebo 32, prazi the low dose groups 31 and a half, high dose group 30.75. So they are well matched uh, in their um, PD clinical characteristics. So we were absolutely delighted um, to see how great adherence was throughout the first year of Pasadena. So even after one year, where, uh, oh, I think I forgot to mention, I'm, I apologize, that since we increased the number of tests, we now only ask individuals to perform half of the battery of tests, active tests every day, and the other half on the second day. So it's also not as boring. It's not doing the same thing every day. But still, we are asking them to do something, do perform active tests once a day. And you see here the... Um, proportion of, of times per week, the individuals were fully compliant with the testing schedule. So that at the end of a uh, year, it was still, they were still performing all of the assigned active tests, five, a little more than five of the seven days a week. And you see also from passive monitoring on smartphone and smart and wearables that we're getting um, quite a few hours of um, this passive monitoring data from both devices. So I mentioned to you that we aggregate the sensor features that we have from the active tests or from passive monitoring within a two week window to make them more robust and the test retest reliability of those sensor features ended up being, as you might expect, also very high. So we're very pleased with those uh, test retest reliabilities. And of course, it's very important for us because we are always thinking about change over time, change over time. So. Um, in order to show a change over time, you really want to minimize that uh, the test retest um, variability. But first, we'd like to show you how some of the new tasks uh, relate to um, standard MDS UPDRS uh, type of scores. So here at hand turning was related to the pronation supination test. You see a straw, and again, um, the maximum speed of the hand turning with the smartphone is on the Y axis again, aggregated over two weeks, you see a nice correspondence. But perhaps a video is, is worth uh, more than a few words. So I think the video nicely depicts how the highlighted subject A and subject B um, quite, can quite differ with respect to hand turning performance using this task and it's able to be picked up by these accelerometers. We also had some indication that um, that individuals who may have fluctuating symptoms, that these can also be caught dur if, if during the testing at home. So here, subject B is an individual that received a score of zero at the site visit. But if you look at this individual's performance at home, indeed, we are finding instances where one does not quite see a normal um, hand turning performance. And the last example I'll show um, is uh, from the draw shape task. So here uh, participants are shown um, a figure on the screen and they're tr to trace it with their finger as quickly as, as and as accurately as possible. And um, here is the, the sensor feature that you're seeing on the Y axis is the dwell time at the corners. This was compared with handwriting uh, on the MDS UPDRS. So of course, um, this is all about determining whether um, these kinds of technologies can be used in 
clinical trials to detect potential treatment effects. And we believe the first um, um, prerequisite to that, actually having individuals that perform the tests are adherent to the testing protocol was achieved. Of course, these were highly motivated patients and it's not the same clearly as a observational non-clinical drug study uh, where motivations might be different. Um, and by having, to, by having these data that had been collected every day, they enabled us to model the slopes of motor sign progression. And this is particularly interesting for us because uh, when one wants to think about uh, disease modifying um, therapies, one hopes that um, treated and placebo groups, their curves diverge over time. So for these analyses, we looked at a total of 17 pre-specified sensor features, so one per task and side of the body, as well as features from passive monitoring. I've noted multiple times they were aggregated over fortnights, but now every fortnight within the 52 weeks. We did censor um, all the data at the start of symptomatic PD treatment. So. Um, if the individuals went on to PD treatment, then all the data thereafter were no longer included in our model. And that was the same, um, the same strategy that was used to analyze the clinical data. And for the present analyses, we combined both treatment groups. So there was a high and low dose group of presentezimab into one pooled group. As mentioned, we were able to use linear mixed effects models with random slopes, looking at changes from baseline. The covariates were the same as were used for the clinical data. You see them here. And this was an exploratory analysis. So we set the alpha at 0 0.2 and the beta at 0 0.8 and corrected for multiple co comparisons using a 15% false discovery rate. There were some LMEs whose um, residuals were non-linearly distributed, and in such cases, we applied mixed models with repeated measures. And of course, the effect of interest was the interaction of Fortnite by treatment group. Now, following this 15% um, FDR correction, two features survived. One was speed of tapping variability, which you see on the top row, and the second was the passively monitored power of hand gestures in daily life. So something coming from the smartwatch. On the left side, you see the raw changes. On the right side, you see the model changes. So top right is an LME and bottom right is an MMRM. Placebo is in blue, pooled prosy group is in green. And for both the uh, speed of tapping as well as a gesture power, you see that the pooled prosinezumab group declines at a slower rate compared to the placebo group. We were also interested in combining the sensor features that we had into a kind of composite score. And, and we did do this, uh, it's called, the, we call it the Pasadena Digital Motor Score. It's comprised of mainly bradykinesia and tremor measures. And also in this score, and here you see the, the different dose groups um, uh, were analyzed separately. You see, again, using this composite score, uh, a divergence in the slopes of progression of prosonizumab treated now in red compared to placebo in blue. So we do believe we have very high hopes for the comprehensive measurement of core motor signs of PD remotely, continuously, and something's and objectively. And of course, these may provide unprecedented insights into patients functioning, not just because we're able to test frequently, the tests only take a few minutes uh, per day, uh, we tell patients it's like brushing your teeth that should become part of your daily routine and yet give us such rich information, not to mention the world of passive monitoring and the possibilities that they enable us to understand more about how this disease is impacting patients' daily lives. Uh, we have shown strong adherence, test retest reliability, and preliminary clinical validity. And um, certainly in the Pasadena study, we believe we showed that the Pasadena mobile application of version two, um, well, certainly we could uh, model the slopes of motor sign decline. And then an exploratory analysis, we demonstrated a, diver a divergence of slopes and bradykinesia progression. Um, looking forward, of course, we are also interested in cognitive tasks, so building out um, what kinds of cognitive tasks are included in the battery. We are actively working on that. Of course, um, we also are thinking of, with many others, what might be the potential future, future use cases outside of clinical trials, for example, in patient monitoring to identify prodromal patients. 
Um, of course, coming from Roche, we are interested in, in developing digital endpoints for use in drug development decision making. And uh, we wholeheartedly support all the data sharing initiatives so important to facilitate progress in this field. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much. That was just a, a wonderful presentation and right in line with um, everything that we're, we're trying to achieve with today's symposium and thinking about how do we practically take these uh, biomarkers and incorporate them into endpoints in clinical trials. So please put your questions for Kristen in the uh, question and answer. Um, and then we will also circle back to some of those to answer live during our group uh, discussion at the end. Um, in the meantime, I'd like to, um, to ask um, our next speaker to please share her slides. So uh, Dr. Uh, Shella Keary is at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, she joined the Penn Frontotemporal Dementia Center um, uh, in September 2019. Um, she has a PhD in speech language pathology and is going to be speaking to us today on uh, something that I think is, is a very um, exciting uh, topic with regards to uh, digital biomarkers, and that is taking automated speech analysis for the assessment of uh, Lewy body dementias uh, with um, AD co-pathology. So uh, have you, I, I saw your slides and then they went away. <laughs> there you go. Not quite in presentation mode yet. There you go. Perfect. Okay, that looks good. And if you wouldn't mind unmuting. Hi. Perfect. Excellent. Go ahead. Sorry, we use blue jeans at Penn, so Zoom is still new to me. So uh, thank you so much for having me here. Uh, my name is Sanjana Shelley Carey. Um, I am a postdoc researcher at the Frontotemporal Degeneration Center. And the talks have been very interesting so far. And I'm very excited to share our recent work looking at automated speech metrics in Lewy body dementias with AD copathology. So um, LBD is primarily characterized by alpha synuclein pathology. However, up to 50% of cases show um, Alzheimer's disease copathology at autopsy. Now, Alzheimer's disease copathology is, uh, has detrimental prognostic effects. Um, it's associated with a faster dementia onset and a shorter survival time. So as the figure on the right shows, uh, you can see that tau is a driving factor for this poor prognosis. Um, we're looking at survival curves, um, and you can see that the different colors correspond to different levels of AD uh, neuropathologic burden, and the lines corresponding to intermediate and high, which is in red and purple, show significantly worse survival than the green and blue, which show low to no Alzheimer's disease copathology. So identifying Alzheimer's disease copathology in vivo is important for uh, predicting prognosis and for providing uh, timely individualized patient care. Uh, furthermore, we want to stratify patients based on underlying pathology because this is critical for clinical trials and ultimately developing targeted and effective therapies. So there's currently no clear clinical picture uh, phenotype to distinguish AD copathology in LBD. Uh, early autopsy studies have linked AD copathology to DLB or dementia of Lewy body phenotype uh, reporting greater prevalence and more severe tau and amyloid uh, in DLB patients than patients with PDD or Parkinson's disease dementia. Um, however, more recent large autopsy studies that look at the whole spectrum have failed to reliably distinguish AD copathology in these two syndromes. So the distinction of PDD and DLB um, is primarily characterized by the motor to dementia time interval. So if we would suspect AD Copathology to map onto this, we would expect there to be a relationship with higher AD burden in cases with shorter intervals. However, we can see that the AD neuropathologic burden is quite spread uh, throughout the whole spectrum. So currently, um, in vivo identification of AD copathology is achievable with CSF AD biomarkers, but these are invasive, and uh, molecular PET imaging, which can be uh, costly and not readily available at, in all settings. 
So there remains a need for uh, additional non-invasive and expensive tools that we can use as screeners for AD copathology in this population. However, this is not to say that there aren't important clinical distinctions between those with AD and then those without. We consistently see that AD copathology has a specific influence on the phenotypic expression in the language domain. So here we can see that patients in the combined group with uh, LBD and AD copathology have uh, significantly worse language scores than pure LBD at all stages of disease. Um, uh, these language scores include verbal fluency, but of particular interest is confrontation naming, which has been consistently shown to be impaired in previous investigations and is interesting, particularly because it appears to be relatively preserved in pure Lewy body dementias. Um, studies have shown that naming scores correlate with CSF tau levels in this group and postmortem uh, tau percent area occupied in digital neuropathological investigations. Um, the digital studies have also shown that it's specifically related to tau in the temporal lobe. And we have MRI studies showing that the confrontation naming deficits are associated with uh, temporal atrophy. So with all this being said, uh, it, it shows that language studies are interesting and for, unwarranted. However, our current language testing is limited to uh, verbal fluency and confrontation naming. Um, the analysis of natural speech would allow us to assess uh, multiple facets of language simultaneously. So based on the existing naming literature and studies indicating a greater tau accumulation in uh, LBD plus AD in temporal lobes, we hypothesized specific lexical semantic impairments in LBD plus AD that would be associated with temporal atrophy. So our study assessed automated speech measures derived from a picture description of the cookie theft scene, which is part of the Boston Diagnostic Aphasia Exam. The participants were asked to describe the picture using full sentences for about a minute. Um, they were allowed to continue for longer if they needed, and they were prompted to speak if they were uh, stop if they stopped describing the picture too early. We audio recorded these speech samples in natural field settings, like in the hospital or at patients' homes, and we used a remote recording device such as a smartphone. So here's an overview of our acoustic and lexical pipelines, which uses the audio files and the text transcripts to derive over 30 automated speech measures. So I wanna, I'd like to emphasize that these speech measures are, are, uh, are, my, are different than the automatic, classi automatic classification studies in speech you might've seen, which tend to be more black box. Whereas our 30, 34 measures are, um, they all relate to a, a neuropsych or social or physiological phenomenon and are clinically interpretable. So I'll go over, uh, the two methods are two pipelines in a little bit more detail in the following slides. So first we characterize various aspects of the acoustic properties. So this is the physical properties of speech and this relates to how we say things. So this here is a segment of the speech recording. Um, we have time on the X axis and this top tier here is the waveform. We have the spectrogram showing the frequencies in the middle tier and this bottom tier corresponds to the output of our speech activity detector which automatically segments the audio into voiced speech and silent uh, non-speech segments. Um, we, then sum we, uh, we then summarize the speech and non-speech segments across the whole recording, and we calculate summarized outcome measures such as mean speech duration and mean pause duration and pause rate. Um, we also track the pitch or FO or fundamental frequency, which is shown in blue here, um, this corresponds to the, the vibration, the frequency vibration of our vocal folds. And as we change the pitch of our voice, the FO moves with it. And we track this across the recording and summarize uh, FO range or pitch range. So we were, we're also interested in what the patients are saying, not just how they're saying it. So here we're looking at a typical tokenized transcript, which you can read from top to bottom. Um, our automated algorithm tags each speech token into its parts of speech. So was it a noun, was it a verb, was it a determiner, et cetera. Um, and we calculate 
uh, parts of speech, we calculate average parts of speech count across the full recording. And we also derive measures, a lexical semantic measures for each word. So for example, how frequent is the word in English? What is the average age at which this word is acquired? How ambiguous, uh, ambiguous is the word, et cetera. And we average these for per recording to get mean lexical semantic ratings to get an overall impression of how rich or diverse their language is. We also calculate measures that combine the previous acoustic pipeline and this lexical pipeline. For example, articulatory rate, which is in syllables per second, and speaking rate, which is in words per minute. So we compared these automated speech measures between 22 patients with AD copathology, uh, which I'll refer to as SIN plus AD for the rest of this presentation, and 38 SIN minus AD. Um, the, the AD copathology was confirmed using neuropathological diagnosis or autopsy validated CSF AD biomarker cut points. Um, we included all Lewy body spectrum disorders with dementia. So we excluded pure PD patients that didn't show any evidence of cognitive impairments during their disease course. And we compared speech to 30 healthy controls. So uh, all three groups were matched on sex, age, and education. Um, the ratio of PDD to DLB was also was similar in the SIN plus AD and SIN minus AD group. And uh, the two patient groups were similar on all neuropsych tests, including MMSC total scores and UPDRS uh, part three motor scores. And they did differ on the Boston naming test, which is in line with previous uh, studies that found confrontation naming impairments in SIN plus AD. So what did we find? Um, our findings showed that there are distinct lexical semantic impairments in speech of patients with uh, AD copathology. So compared to those without AD copathology, SIN plus AD used nouns that had a lower age of acquisition, uh, meaning they use nouns that are learned at a younger age than an older age. So an example of this would be using a chair instead of stool to describe what the boy was standing on. So researchers have shown that age of word acquisition affects the speed and accuracy with which the word is accessed and processed. So early learned words uh, typically elicit faster response times and so are uh, thought to be cognitively less demanding to retrieve than late learned words. We also found that SIN plus AD had a less dense idea lexicon, less dense lower idea density or a less dense lexicon. So this is a ratio of their content words to total words. So content words are nouns, uh, are nouns, verbs, adverbs, and adjectives. Um, and measures of idea density are, are thought to provide an indication of communicative adequacy despite any possible disruptions at to language at the sentence level. So both of these measures have been shown to be impaired in clinical AD as well. Um, we also found that SIN plus AD produced significantly fewer adjectives uh, than healthy controls, and this was normalized to text length. So we calculated adjective count per 100 words, and it was significantly less. And this was not seen in the, in the SIN minus AD group. So we wanted to test if these three lexical semantic measures could distinguish SIN plus AD from SIN minus AD in a logistic regression model. We found that age of acquisition of nouns and idea density were both independent predictors of SIN plus AD. And we also tested if the Boston naming test scores uh, could classify SIN plus AD versus SIN minus AD, and BNT was also a significant predictor. Now, uh, we wanted to compare the two. We wanted to compare if our speech protocol uh, could identify this group better than the neuropsych test of BNT. And we report excellent AUC values of 0.82 versus BNT at 0.69. So while the lexical semantic measures show distinct uh, differences in SIN plus AD, we found that the acoustic measures were similarly impaired in both SIN plus AD and SIN minus AD relative to controls. So specifically, we see shorter speech segment durations and more frequent pausing in both groups relative to controls. And these two measures are reciprocally related to each other. 
So we think this could be a reflection of their shared motor speech features. Uh, more frequent pausing and rushed speech with shorter speech segments are characteristic of hypokinetic dysarthria of PD etiology and other Parkinsonian disorders. Um, another possibility is that these reflect a socio-behavioral deficit seen in LBD dementia. So we see the typical hesitation markers in speech, um, and this could be related to the striatal orbitofrontal connections. We also found longer pauses and a slower speaking rate in both groups relative to controls. Now we think this might be a non-specific cognitive marker of dementia in LBD. Um, we don't think this could be a motor marker because we actually expect faster articulation rates in uh, hypokinetic dysarthria. And we've seen slower speaking rate and longer pauses in our, uh, in our investigations in aphasia. And last, we see reduced FO range in both of our groups. Now, FO manipulation issues could be due to motor issues, um, which does result in a lower range of motion of oral musculature, including the vocal folds. Um, it could also be a reflection of dementia and LBD, as we've seen reduced FO range as a consequence of uh, frontal behavioral changes in BVFTD. So untangling these motor from cognitive effects on impaired speech needs to be further pursued in, in future studies. So we wanted to compare these speech measures uh, between PDD and DLB to see if clinical syndromic distinctions could identify measures of underlying biology. Um, the PDD group was significantly older and the DLB group had uh, worse MMSC scores. So after controlling for these confounds on speech, we found that none of our speech measures differed between PDD and DLB. So we also examined associations between these speech measures and hypothesis specific areas in the language dominant left hemisphere. And this was because we wanted to develop a mechanistic hypothesis for our speech observations. We focused on temporal and frontal regions as these lobes show uh, tau accumulation in syn plus AD and or are associated with greater uh, sign nucleopathy in cases with LBD and AD copathology. So we found significant group interactions for the following regions. We found a lower age of acquisition of nouns was related to thinning in left uh, temporal occipital regions that are part of the visual object processing system stream. Uh, and this relationship was only true for the SYN plus AD group. Specifically, it was in the left fusiform and left inferior temporal. Now, these two areas are uh, involved in object representation, linking visuals with semantic and phonological representations. They have been previously implicated in age of acquisition effects for uh, uh, overt object naming studies that have shown greater activation uh, in these regions for late learned words versus early acquired objects. Um, so the fusi form also overlaps with the site of the so-called uh, visual word form area, which is arguably involved not just in the visual word recognition, but also in the broader mapping of visual inputs to semantics and phonology. So this hypothesis linking regions of object representation to age of acquisition is relevant to our findings of a picture description task where participants make lexical selections based on their visual processing of the scene. We also found that lower idea density was associated with thinning in left caudal middle frontal in syn plus AD only. Now the caudal middle frontal corresponds to uh, Broadman's area six and nine, or the ventral premotor cortex and the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Now this area is where over 70% of the fiber tracts of the arcuate fasciculus terminates. Um, and this is a very important language tract, which is part of the dorsal language processing stream. Uh, specifically, it's the supplementary subdivision of this, of this tract. And this is responsible for interconnecting supplementary language areas. And it's been involved in semantic processing as well as uh, lexical selection. So our finding is in line with previous reports that have shown lower idea density linked to this region um, in, in a large group of aphasic speakers of mixed etiologies. So 
In conclusion, we found distinct lexical semantic impairments in SIN plus AD. And these were related to areas that we know are known to be vulnerable to tau or greater sign nucleop sign nucleopathy in um, LBD plus AD. By contrast, the acoustic measures related to how the person speaks was similarly impaired in both of our groups. And we need to further investigate whether this is due to the shared motor or the uh, dementia and LBD uh, effects. We saw that our automated speech protocol performed better than BNT for ROCs distinguishing SIN plus AD from SIN minus AD. And now this has practical advantages to the BNT. Uh, it's repeatable because we don't have, we don't see practice effects because we don't, this is it's an unconstrained speech task. It's a natural speech task. Um, we don't see ceiling effects since our speech measures don't have a max, maximum score. And thus they may be more sensitive to earlier subclinical impairments. Possibly this needs to be further investigated. And um, we can't overemphasize the ease in data collection in natural field settings and our automated analysis, which um, makes this feasible in widespread clinical settings. We saw that our, our comparisons between clinical syndromes uh, suggested that distinctions between PDD and DLB may not be helpful for biological stratification. And um, overall, we our findings suggest that automatic speech analytics may be useful in screening LBD patients for concomitant AD pathology. The next step would be to validate this in a larger sample, uh, do some machine learning algorithms to improve feature selection and uh, uh, test this in a independent second sample. So I, sh I end with uh, Dr. William Osler's quote that he said to his neurology students saying, listen to your patient, he is telling you the diagnosis. So thank you all for your time and I look forward to discussing this at the end of this session. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much for that, that, um, that wonderful uh, discussion. I, I, I love the quote at the end as well. Indeed, our patients are telling us their diagnosis. It turns out even more than ever. So please send your, uh, your questions um, in the Q&A uh, as, as you start thinking about them and we'll try to address as many um, in real time and then at the session at the end. So moving on, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Martina Mancini, who is Assistant Professor of Neurology and Biomedical Engineering um, at uh, OHSU Parkinson Center and co-director of the Balance Disorders Laboratory there. She will be talking to us about wearable sensors for motor monitoring and your slides look good. Uh, take it away, Martina. Thank you very much. I want to uh, thank the organizer for the invitation. It's really an honor to be here. Um, I'm going to dive in since my life has been made easier here in this presentation from the previous talk of Dr. K uh, of the, um, and, and following on actigraphy as well as a talk by Roche. Um, I'm talking about slightly different wearable sensor. Those are mainly research grade sensor. Um, they are also small and lightweight, rechargeable, uh, or they have replaceable batteries. The battery life uh, uh, can be hours to uh, also days, depending which kind of technology they embed inside. Uh, we can place one to many sensor on different body segment. We can store and download the data or real time streaming. And also we can do the uh, download um, directly from home and um, they are wirelessly synchronized between each other. And we have an example of um, one individual with Parkinson's disease wearing uh, eight of these sensors in the laboratory. Um, compared to um, other um, kind of like more commercial grade uh, sensor or actigraphy, we can measure with these commercial grade devices the quality of movement. So not only the quantity, how much a person is walking, how much time they spend in sedentary activity, which kind of activity and intensity, but we can go and find those subtle changes on um, parameters of gait, turning and balance in the same way as we look at those one in the laboratory. And of course, there are several uh, challenges as well to this process that I'm gonna go through in just a little bit, but we can quantify movements such as turning, pace, and variability of gait uh, during unsupervised 
uh, mobility monitoring. Um, so in the laboratory, we use either six to eight, the, uh, the, the data I will present are um, with uh, opal inertial measurement units. They contain a three axial accelerometer, gyroscope and magnetometer. Um, and for the home, we are using an instrumented SOC prototype that is basically the same technology, uh, but the sensor itself is the, disattached from the battery and it's embedded in fabric, as we can see in the figure here. So it's basically an ankle wrap uh, that is sensorized, we call it. The uh, different kind um, of uh, um, measure and of mobility testing that we can do in the laboratory are supervised and structured conventional mobility testing when we have a course where people can walk, turn, or um, standing still if we want to assess balance. The one at home start to be a little bit more tricky. They are either unsupervised but structured. Uh, so the active test that has been referred to in the Roche presentation earlier, or completely unsupervised and unstructured. And also those one were referred to. Um, and there are several challenges to also analyze this data. And I hope to get into that a little bit more. Um, going to the different aspect of balancing gate that we can assess, balancing gate is not only one concept. There are multiple and different aspects that are independent between each other. So while in the lab, we can pretty much address a lot of balance components such as gait, turning, sway, variability, which allow us to find a specific impairment in one of those domains and perhaps act on that. Um, during unsupervised uh, mobility uh, monitoring, things are a little bit more complicated because we don't know what's happening. The environment is different from everybody, uh, but we can still uh, identify bouts of gait, which are basically segment of walking, uh, turning, variability, activity. Um, and also we can uh, think about measuring uh, postural control if prescribed, but it's a little bit tricky if a person is uh, at risk for falls. But how do those measures compare between each other? Um, this slide is a courtesy of Professor Jace, uh, Jeff Ausdorf in Tel Aviv, where he compared the lab usual walking versus the uh, daily living uh, typical walking. Finding in people with Parkinson's disease um, that the um, gait in the laboratory is similar to the daily living walking, only if we look at the average. During daily living, we have a lot of more measure. We can see, uh, we can measure um, an individual at the best performances and at the worst performances. And we can see that the daily worst performance is much worse than um, the laboratory measure and also much worse than the average as well as the best. Um, diving and here the dual task is often used in the laboratory to mimic daily life, which we could say it might successful mimic daily life if we just think about the average and not the fluctuation that happen in daily life. Um, thinking about correlations with gait and variability and but also aspect of balance, I know this one might be a little much, but <clears throat> it's basically a correlation matrix where the color um, is indicating a, a higher correlation, uh, warmer, and also the size of the circle, the bigger the size, the, strongest, the stronger the correlation. We have in the x-axis the home unsupervised daily measures of uh, gait, turning, and variability of gait and turning indicated with the uh, coefficient of variation. And in the uh, y-axis, we have a um, prescribed task in the laboratory. And we can appreciate that while uh, the average gait in the laboratory correlates pretty much with the average gait um, at home, the aspect of variability of gait and turning at home do not correlate with anything that we measure in the laboratory. So it's basically giving us some uh, different and further information that uh, potentially very interesting to discriminate also uh, in prodromal phases. Um, interestingly, 
turning or changing direction while walking in daily life is instead correlated with many aspects of gait, turning, as well as balance quantified by this way area here, which is potentially interesting. Um, so basically what we are looking over here in people with Parkinson's disease versus healthy control is that daily life measure of gait could be more sensitive to impairment than the same measure in prescribed tests. And this is true for turning in people with Parkinson's disease. We can see that um, we observe a significant difference in people with moderate Parkinson's disease um, during daily turns, but not um, in during prescribed turns. And that was quite interesting. Um, on, the, on the left side, we have uh, a measure of foot clearance while walking. And uh, uh, while the trend is similar, we can see that people with Parkinson's disease have lower clearance compared to people with multiple sclerosis and healthy controls. We see that these differences are significant only in the community during daily life, but not in the laboratory. Um, similarly, the effect size can be larger for community unsupervised monitoring than for laboratory. And what that means, it translates to having less subject needed in a clinical trial. For example, we see that the area under the curve in discriminating people with Parkinson's disease from healthy control is larger um, if we look at the community walking compared to the laboratory walking. And so that would potentially translate to measures that we can use earlier to identify changes. Uh, we need to be careful because walking in daily life is very different from the walking concept that we have of the laboratory course. And even, even if we can measure the same parameters, um, we need to pay attention to the fact that the, uh, the gate bouts in unsupervised monitoring are very short. They are less than 20 strides. And in the laboratory, what we measure, we want at least 30 to 50 strides to have also reliable measures of variability in the laboratory. Um, and it's interesting to see that at home, as it shows in this diagram, healthy controls are in green, people with Parkinson's disease are in purple, and people with multiple sclerosis are in um, orange. Uh, we can see that ev almost everybody has these uh, short bouts. And then when we go to longer walk, those one really reflects less than 10% of the average walking that we do at home. And here we have a snapshot of what is um, before 19 to 23 strides. So very little. And that could also influence the measure that we are uh, looking at. Um, I don't have data on gait and in people with um, Lewy body dementia, but uh, I knew a group in uh, Newcastle that is actively working, especially Dr. Ardo, on um, looking at different gait signature for um, people with Alzheimer's disease and people with Lewy body dementia. Um, they use a different approach. In fact, they use a sensor on the low back uh, and not uh, a three sensor approach but they show a similar measure to what we are quantifying and finding significant differences um, in between people with Alzheimer's disease and Lewy body dementia for asymmetry of gait and measure of um, gait variability, such as the variability of step time and the variability of step length in people with um, dementia with Lewy body compared to people with Alzheimer's. Um, so perhaps if we don't want to think about the gate bouts or we don't want to um, go in, it, because it is also difficult to uh, validate um, what we are measuring at home in gate, perhaps we can take a look at turning um, and it could be uh, an easier measure um, to uh, quantify mobility. Uh, turning is a ubiquitous activity that we do. Um, you can see uh, this woman uh, with Parkinson's disease is wearing uh, um, a camera on, the, on her waist, and you can see the amount of turning that she does in just um, a couple of minutes. 
turning are critical for daily functional activity. In fact, uh, every activity involves a little bit or a certain amount of turning. They are harder to control compared to steady stag gait and falls during turning results in impact on the femur and fractures. Um, what we found in a previous study is that the uh, quality um, and not the quantity of turning differentiated between people with Parkinson's disease and healthy controls. We found in uh, uh, a small cohort of 14 people with moderate Parkinson's disease that the mean active rate was similar among the two groups, as well as the number of turns per hour was similar. However, the average turning velocity uh, was reduced in people with Parkinson's disease and the number of steps was increased. And um, interestingly, um, we can also see the aspect of variability. Uh, people with Parkinson's disease show higher variability within the days and across days compared to healthy controls. Here we have some 3D diagrams where we have the um, day, hours of the day, and the uh, measure of turning variability. We see a kind of like minimal variation in healthy controls why we can observe um, a higher variability in people with moderate Parkinson's disease with a UPDRS motor of 14 mild and a more uh, a larger variability in individuals with most severe Parkinson's disease. Um, variability of turning is something that we also found to be sensitive pro probably to future falls. Uh, so the data needs to be validated in a second cohort, but what we found, and we can see an example in the uh, 3D plot here, this is in older people with or without mild cognitive impairment, a cohort of 35 older adults. And this one was um, a project funded from, uh, a small project funded from Orcatech uh, some years back. And we see the uh, people that will experience a fall in the following six months from testing show a higher variability of the number of steps for uh, needed in a turn compared to a person who will not experience a fall in the following six months. And this is uh, um, prospective falls. Um, a similar uh, work was also conducted in Italy by Leach and uh, Chiari. Um, looking more closely to uh, mild cognitive impairment, we also find in the same subject population, if we split with people with no cognitive impairment and mild cognitive impairment, we can see uh, the turning duration, number of steps per turn, and peak velocity are all in more impaired in people with mild cognitive impairment compared to people who do not have mild cognitive impairment. Um, and lastly, in, uh, in the same cohort, we observe, um, since Orcatech has this great um, Z-scores domain for a different kind of cognitive function, we observe the, the uh, quality of turning, uh, the duration, the velocity, and the variability of turning were related to visuospatial function and memory aspect of cognitive functions, which could be interesting for um, more exploration on how cognitive uh, function fluctuate, fluctuate together with a uh, measure of uh, turning in time. Um, we did a small collaboration study in, with uh, uh, Dr. Agrawal and John Hopkins in 12 individuals with dementia. Um, some of them had uh, Alzheimer's dementia, some of them multifactorial, only one of them had Lewy body dementia and uh, other had vascular dementia. Um, and in this population, we used a different setup with only one sensor on the belt. Um, and uh, the time of wearing was four days compared to our usual seven days. Um, and we basically did this study to see if it was even feasible to have people with dementia wear a sensor on the belt for four days. We found that everybody wore it. And of course, there were um, the majority of people had caregiver that would help them with, uh, with the sensor. And these sensors are worn only for um, kind of like the active part of the day or from morning to evening, not during sleep because they need to be recharged, unfortunately. 
Um, one of the uh, symptoms that uh, Dr. Agrawal was interested in is uh, the wandering behavior. Often people with dementia get lost or don't know where to have to go. Um, and we found that turning might be an helpful marker um, to detect wandering behaviors in people with dementia. This is very, very preliminary, but what we observed is that people who uh, had a history of wandering behavior um, have an increased number of turns, averaged by 30 minutes, and also a decreased turning duration, which could um, imply that there is a slightly different uh, turning behavior, but also maybe they are thinking or getting confused and having to go back and turn around to uh, other points of the house or of the community because we are able to measure both home um, motor function as well as when people are out uh, and about with the sensor. And lastly, thinking about um, tracking longitudinal progression, um, I reported two examples that we have. Um, the first in the left is in the laboratory on turning duration and how it could potentially track longitudinal progression of Parkinson's disease. Here, we had a small cohort of 13 individuals uh, with untreated de novo Parkinson's disease, three years from diagnosis, and uh, age match controls. And they were followed and come, came to the lab every six months. Um, and here we can see how in people with untreated PD, turning was initially abnormal already, but it was also getting worse um, in time, especially after 18 months and 12 months. On the example on the, uh, on the right, we have uh, community uh, monitoring unsupervised, and we only have three uh, individuals with moderate Parkinson's disease, all on levodopa medication, but we also observed a worsening of uh, aspect of jerkiness of turning as well as velocity variability um, in the 12 month uh, follow up. And we use this one as a pilot data for um, a grant that is um, under review at the moment. And um, so I went through uh, quite quickly to promise and challenges of unsupervised daily uh, life monitoring mobility. Um, I just want to basically mention the promise are very high and a lot uh, because it's a more realistic and real world monitoring. Um, there is a natural environment, there is more dual task, uh, there isn't the white coat effect that brings people, especially with Parkinson's disease, to perform so much better when they are observed and when they are in the lab. Uh, we can tell how sedentary or active an individual is, we can potentially measure fluctuation and variability of motor behavior, and it seems we have better effect size compared to measure of uh, motor behavior in the lab. However, there are also many challenges. The definitions of gait are unclear. Um, it is uncontrolled. It's much more variable than what we can see in the laboratory, which brings to also maybe less reliable. Um, it, it's harder to validate because it need uh, a, cam a video camera mounted uh, to basically make sure that what we are measuring it is. But once it's validated, then we don't have to uh, replicate validation study over and over. Um, and data management could also be an issue because we are generating large um, data files. Um, but most of all, standardization and harmonization of these measure and definition is uh, needed. And I wanted to leave with uh, uh, kind of like this uh, multimodal uh, slide that I bought from um, a paper here on research criteria for diagnosis of dementia with Lewy body. And I just uh, hope that uh, maybe unsupervised mobility could have a place uh, um, in, in the um, detection and monitoring of dementia with Lewy body. And I want to thank um, the organizer again for inviting me, um, Professor Fay Orak, who has been always an inspiration for all this work, um, Vrutang Shah, who is the postdoc and conducted a lot of work on GATE, and um, APDM wearable technology uh, to, for providing the uh, prototype of the smart socks that we are using um, in our grant funding for the work I presented. And thank you for your attention, and I'm looking forward to take any questions. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Mancini. Please put questions for her in the Q&A, uh, which she can uh, both address in real time here as well as in our discussion. So our final speaker for all of our I, I invite all of our speakers to uh, please join us back for our uh, discussion. And I also uh, want to encourage any uh, intent attendees who would like to be um, unmuted to, to join um, the discussion or ask their, their question in person to please go ahead and, and do so. And I will pass it off to Joe. Great. Um, thanks for all those great talks. You, you know, the thing that I find myself, and I'll get to some of these questions as they roll in, but the thing that I find myself wondering uh, is um, how available these uh, different uh, wonderful technologies are going to be to the LBDA consortium if we wanted to incorporate them. So, so maybe the, the toughest one might be Roche, since I, I'm suspecting that's the most proprietary. Dr. Taylor, could you comment on that? So we are actually working on a solution that can be a BYOD for anyone interested in, um, in using this technology. And um, this is still being drafted out, this plan, and then we need to find the funding. And then, but that is our intention. What, to... what is, is BYOD bring your own dollars or what, what is it? <laughs> bring your own device. Nice. So we would make the apps available in both of the stores and then anybody oh. who wanted to could download them. That is our vision. Um, oh. And we're on the path. Fantastic. Any uh, idea about a timeline on that? So we were hoping to get started at the end of this year, but we're going to have to see how funding works out. Great. That's wonderful to hear. Dr. Shell Curie, um, is your stuff shareable? Um, I'd actually like to invite Naomi to answer this. Okay. Because I am a relatively new postdoc, if I can still say that, being in my second year. <laughs> <laughs> Naomi, I think you're in the audience, right? She is. So can we unmute her by any chance? I think she can unmute herself, Kathleen. Is that right? Uh... I don't think we let people unmute themselves. Oh. <laughs> Naomi, I tell you what, why don't you put something in the chat or in the Q&A and I'll read that. In the meantime, let's move on to Martina. Uh, Martina, can you tell us about how available um, the OPAL's methodology is and a little bit about cost and that sort of thing? Yeah, so the, um, the technology for uh, laboratory is, is available and in the market. The one, the one for uh, home monitoring is a prototype. Um, they are making good progress, uh, but I'm not sure about that timeline. I would love to speak with them about it, yeah. Okay, great. And, and Dr. Stefaroni, the all FTD uh, app. Yeah, so the, um, you know, we've, we've worked with Data Cubed Health on this. And um, so the, all of these tests are available th through them. Um, you know, it, it's a, a company that you can reach out to and contact um, if you're interested in, um, in uh, using these tests. You can also reach out to me. I'm happy to answer any questions. And the tests that we're developing, like the motor ones I just shared, we have an IP agreement such that, um, you know, they can be shared by the company as well. So those should be available too. Okay. And I believe Naomi's been moved over to a panelist, so can uh, okay. answer. Oh, sure. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Yep. Oh, sorry. Um, Zoom did something weird again. <laughs> um, I believe the question was about the shareability of our uh, tools and methods. Uh, yes, definitely uh, our partners at the Linguistic Data Consortium uh, are geared towards um, uh, speech data um, uh, distribution. So um, with uh, appropriate agreements, we're more than happy to, to share our methods and we are sharing them with other collaborators. Great. All right, wonderful. Um, you know, one of the other things that came through in some of the questions was sort of comparing these different uh, platforms for measuring, capturing the same sort of thing. Someone was asking whether the, the Roche platform captured some um, automated speech and, and whether that might be contrasted with uh, uh, the group from Penn. Um, so we are collecting some um, 
relatively unsupervised speech, right? So they read something, which is a nice contrast in PD to then their spontaneous response to that question. Um, we are working also with, with other groups in the United States and have come across some privacy issues in sharing speech data. Um, so I think that would need to be looked into. But otherwise, we do share data through PPMI, for example. Okay. Great. Um, and then uh, there was a question about uh, a number of these devices are looking at <clears throat> motor findings, and, and it really is nice to see um, how they can take uh, capture some of the fluctuations and also take out some of the noise of our traditional measurements in Parkinson's disease. But one of the questioners asked about motor function is so variable in, in DLB. Is there a way to think about uh, normalizing these measures um, uh, across patients? And I'm not sure I captured that question just right. Um, uh, it came from Marwan. If you want to unmute, I think you can clarify what you were looking for there. <laughs> or maybe so we, we've been very, we of course are extremely interested in variability, right? Because we want to measure disease progression. Mm -hmm. And um, one way that we go about doing that is, is certainly at the tail end to aggregate the features that we have. But uh, before that, there's a big QC process, you know, clean the data, make sure that patients were actually doing the job and then selecting the appropriate sensor uh, feature, right? Because you can create thousands of features, but what is most appropriate and what is robust, right? And what changes with time? Sort of on the on the tail end of that, I, I have a quick question for our panelists. So most of the data that we showed this afternoon, simply because there isn't data in dementia with Lewy body patients, for the most part, with regards to what we are talking about here, with the exception of of the data from Penn, um, was either in Parkinson's disease patients or in um, patients with other dementias. What challenges do you all foresee in adapting the technologies that were presented here this afternoon? to a cohort of patients with dementia with Lewy bodies as we start thinking about these measures with regards to, um, with regards to uh, clinical trials in that specific cohort. So we can, we can go in order of the afternoon. We can start with you, Kristen. Okay, so I think one major concern is how severely impaired are they? Because a lot of this is unsupervised testing and the extent to which they would uh, should have um, a caregiver or a partner helping them to remember to do the tasks and hopefully not actually helping to do the tasks. And I think ideally, obviously, one would want a combination of all the wonderful measures that we heard about this afternoon, not just motor, but a rich cognitive uh, testing battery. I think there one would have to be careful that the cognitive tests aren't administered too frequently because even there we're finding robust, uh, um, robust learning effects in, um, for, for a given cognitive test in mildly impaired individuals. So yeah, I think it would need to very carefully, uh, you could put together a beautiful battery based on, for example, what we've heard this afternoon. Sanjana, you have had the opportunity to, uh, to, to do your particular application in DLB patients. Have you run across any DLB specific challenges um, with that experience of yours so far? Um, so uh, we looked at the whole spectrum as a, as a whole, as a harmonized spectrum. Yeah. And I will say that in terms of the speech observations, um, I'm also developing an acoustic pipeline that's looking at motor specific um, vowel, vowel data. And for that, the challenges that I definitely encountered were that um, DLB patients produce less speech. And with less speech, it's harder to get um, measures of my vowel space because there's a minimum speech data that we need to be able to get these metrics. So that is something that we're noticing, but I think it's more related to the severity of the patients because we're seeing this across other neurodegenerative populations that with severity, they just produce less speech, which becomes challenging to analyze. Any problems with the hypophonia that, that, that their voices aren't carrying well enough to be able to capture some of these specific things that you're looking at? So definitely not, we didn't find this specific to DLB syndrome only. This was true for the entire spectrum. 
that um, voice quality does become an issue for acoustic analyses. Um, that if, if you notice for our acoustic pipeline, we don't actually include any phonation measures, but we are, one of the things we wanna do is circumvent these issues and look at voice quality measures, because that would be very interesting in a dsr 3 perspective in this population. Okay. Martina, what do you anticipate? I know you've had some of your PD patients with cognitive impairment pushing the level of cognition more toward dementia. What, what do you anticipate um, being some of the challenges that might be, um, might be encountered if we were to implement your pipeline with a DLB population? I think for, um, for kind of these supervised prescribed task, it's, uh, um, I guess a little test retest reliability because I haven't tested these people before and that could be done in a smaller kind of like 10 to 12 people um, just to make sure that the metrics are reliable. Um, and uh, uh, for home, it's uh, if the short bouts are kind of more common as probably they could be, is it's just a matter of uh, um, basically looking at the short bouts and not maybe combining the rest of it, I would keep that differentiation on, um, especially for this population. Yeah, but having a comprehensive view, um, it would be great, yeah. And Adam, a lot of your your work um, on the app, and this is what I've always worried about with, with um, phone-based cognitive, apps in Parkinsonian patients, given that DLB patients do span such a broad range of no or almost no Parkinsonism to quite significant bradykinesia, do you see um, that as potentially being an issue or, or do you see other issues with implementing your app with the, the DLB population? Yeah, um, so you're thinking about wh whether we would be sensitive to this spectrum of bradykinesia or? More so, would it interfere with your ability to measure cognition? So if the goal is to measure cognition, are non-cognitive features going to interfere? Yeah, I mean, I think that's going to be a challenge with, with any of these patients that have motor features as well. I mean, you know, we have like a single finger tapping test to try to get motor speed and you can try to co-vary that out, but to the degree to how well that works, I'm not sure. You know, we'll catch some of the, um, I think we'll be able to catch some of these cognitive features through the language recordings. So hopefully that'll, that'll be helpful as well. But, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree it's going to be a challenge. And it's also to a degree a challenge for in-person cognitive assessment and, you know, in patients with, the, with, uh, with motor impairments as well. So I think trying to rely on some of the language testing may help us a little bit there. Great. Joe, other questions as we're coming to the top of our time here? Yeah, so one more uh, came in through the question box asking about which platforms are available in non-English languages, which is going to be important for some funding agencies. Um, the Russian um, I platform. can. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, um, well, we are currently collaborating with a, um, an Israeli hospital uh, implementing our methods in, uh, in Hebrew. Um, and we're looking into other collaborations uh, with Genfi, which is the uh, European equivalent for all FTD consortium. So we are hoping to have cross-linguistic studies um, and, and uh, implementing um, speech features in uh, multiple languages. And I also uh, wanted to um, take this opportunity to, especially in relation to the question that you posed before with the, um, uh, the need to normalize the data, that these kind of collaborations like the LBD consortium and the all FTD consortium are especially valuable for speech studies and other uh, digital biomarkers because of the great variability that these um, biomarker data sets have between and within subjects. So especially for longitudinal disease monitoring, we really need a large amount of data um, for that specific purpose. So thanks for letting me <laughs> take this opportunity and say a few words. Sorry for bursting in with you, Kirsten. Not at all. Yeah, we're also all for big data. That's so important. The, why these sharing um, sharing efforts are so important. The Roche um, application is available in many different languages. So American, Spanish, 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 uh, French, German, Hebrew. Um, yeah, many different languages. 
Yeah, and I can say with the app that we're using, um, many of the tests that were um, that we've been using that were already developed have been um, used in you know forty countries at this point, I think. And there's a lot of languages. Some of the tests that we've been developing ourselves and the questionnaires, you know, those we are in the process of translating. Um, so that's that's coming up. All right, I have one last question for, for Dr. Taylor, although um, <clears throat> it's meant to reflect on the, the value of these uh, devices in general. So uh, Dr. Taylor, while, while Roche was conducting the Pasadena trials, uh, Biogen was conducting an almost identical trial with an almost identical antibody, and they walked away from it, uh, assuming that it had failed. And I'm, I'm wondering, do you know, did Biogen incorporate any of this digital methodology in their outcome measures? So I, I couldn't put my hand on the fire and say I know for sure. Uh, I know they're very interested in digital outcome measures, but I, I don't want to say uh, whether they had included it or not. Okay. Yeah. I was trying to set you up to say that that uh, <laughs> yes. use of these digital biomarkers was, was able to detect the treatment effect that was not yes. evident with conventional yes. measures. I don't know whether that's true or not. But uh, anyway. All right, Kathleen, take it away. <clears throat> All right, well, well. Um, as always, our time went very quickly today and I wanna just give uh, an incredibly uh, um, appreciative shout out to all of our speakers today for um, putting together their presentations and for being part of this, this really important symposium. Thank you to all of our participants who uh, engage and ask questions. I'm sorry we couldn't sit here for another hour or two probably having a discussion, but I do encourage everyone to continue the discussion uh, offline um, and, and reach out to each other. Um, this was really meant to be a kickstart, not, um, not an end. And so uh, please continue to engage with each other um, about this. We would really love to see um, some of these measures uh, come, to, come to fruition in our upcoming clinical trials in dementia with Lewy bodies. Thank you as well to the association for, um, for supporting uh, Joe and I in putting this together. And I will pass it over to Todd for final remarks. Yeah, just a quick quick word. I, I've got to tell you this, a um, couple words come to mind. One is humble. I think uh, LBDA uh, representing them, we are truly humbled by this great group of international uh, presentations. And it's it's been wonderful. Uh, greatly appreciate that. I think dedication is another word. The dedication of the people here uh, today is unbelievable. Um, and it really, it's it's so exciting and it leads to my third word, which is hope. And it's, it certainly brings a lot of hope to uh, us as an organization and the people we represent is there's a lot, it seems like there's a lot of movement in this area and that's, that's very, very encouraging. And, and we are gonna uh, make sure that our constituents are aware that all this great work that's going on. And the last word is gratitude. We're, we're forever being, uh, grateful for the people here on this call that have attended and also our, um, certainly Joe and Kathleen for today's event and Dave and the rest of the members of the uh, working group and everybody at LBDA. So thank you. Um, extremely grateful and have a wonderful day. Thank you, guys. Thank, thank you. you.